<clears throat> welcome, welcome everybody to Classic Cast number 13. I think my, my audio should be good. We, we had to make some changes to the audio settings. Uh, hopefully it's fine. Uh, I'm here with Tips Out Baby. I'm here with Stay Safe TV. And uh, also we're joined again by John Stats, uh, former Vanilla WoW level designer, and then also former Vanilla WoW team lead, uh, Mark Kern. And uh, this is, you know, this is something we're very excited about. This is something a lot of people are very excited about. Um, John was with us last week. John, do you want to go ahead and, and reintroduce yourself to anybody who wasn't here last week? Uh, yes, I would. Thank you again for having me again. Um, Classic Cast was gracious enough to welcome me on their, their welcome me on their show uh, to promote my book, uh, The Wow Diary, and it's been it's in its final stages on Kickstarter, which doesn't sound good when I say it that way, but it's uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's, in, it's in the late stages of its Kickstarter, and it's doing very well. And I have to, uh, uh, of course, the WoW fans and uh, uh, classic, classic cast. Uh, thank for that. For sure. For well, sure. Well, you have another three days left on your on your Kickstarter goal, right? So it's it's getting yes. urgent, or times yeah, times we're, coming uh, down. We have sixty six hours left. Um, we've hit all our stretch goals. This book is going to be a lot rarer than the Garden Variety version of uh, the wow diary that you'll find on amazon and there's a lot of bells and whistles on it a lot of ad uh, you know little things we've added to it and uh if anyone's interested in checking it out it's at the wow diary.com and that'll take you straight to the kickstarter some uh some cool stuff book i don't think is comparable to any book that i know of and that's probably one of the reasons why I wrote it because there's, it, it's pretty cool. There's a lot of cool stuff in it. If yeah. you like game, if you like I, game I, development, yeah. We we uh, you were gracious enough to, to, enough to give us a, a little sneak preview of it, and I got to say, I said this last time. Even if you're not much of a reader, there are tons, tons of really cool old vanilla fro photos or pre-vanilla photos of stuff that didn't quite make it into the game. It doubles as a picture book. It's it's really awesome. Mm -hmm. yeah for sure yeah there's some pictures of the office too i uh one of the pictures was mark and shane's desk mark and shane used to sit in the hallways uh, just so that they could be approachable to you know the whole team and mark had up against his wall his diploma his old uh <laughs> his old diploma with a little sticky tab that said 80 grand <laughs> for sale <laughs> uh why did you want to say why you why did you put that on there like what was the thinking behind that mark well you know uh, at the time 80 grand for a law school education was considered a lot and um yeah it, it, it was kind of a joke because I actually used my legal education a lot at Blizzard. And in fact, I wrote uh, the WoW uh, China contract, which was the template for MMO contracts in, uh, in Asia. I, I wrote the outline for that that legal used. And I used my legal education a lot writing the terms of service for Battle.net. And that actually went to court and the clause I wrote held up. So I was happy about that. Nice. But at the same time, <laughs> my, my love was in the game, right? And and my third year of law school, I was making games for Interplay. I was uh, making games for Naughty Dog, and I was skipping all my classes. And so, you know, I, th I thought, well, maybe <laughs> maybe I should get some value out of this law degree other than what I'm doing now. And, right. and so I put a post-it on it, and I said, free Photoshop. I'll Photoshop your name into this law degree. <laughs> <laughs> no takers, though, sadly. That that was early on in the project that you were joking about that. I think later, in, as the project got to realization, that's when all the legal uh, mumbo jumbo actually was so important <laughs> to the company. Well, Mark, I don't, I don't know if it's too late, but yeah. I would love to have a law degree. <laughs> don't do it. Out there. Don't do it. I, I, I went to give a talk at my, my, my old law school, Boston University, and they invited me to come talk to the students, and they all showed up. And I thought that I, was, I had this all presentation laid out about the parallels between law and programming, programming games and law, and how you – you know, do all this. It's very similar in these ways. And I was all ready to talk about this. And they all, to, to a person, said, we just want to know how to get out of law and get into games like you did. Oh, we yeah. want to do law. And I was <laughs> like, oh, wow, what's going on? Yeah. And turns out that, that the legal jobs just had dried up at the time. I don't know how the situation is now, but they were... Nobody wanted to hear my presentation. They just wanted to hear about games and game development and how to get into <laughs> games. A room full That's of right. lawyers to be. 
That's great. So before we get too far ahead, uh, Mark, I mean, we, we already started talking to Mark a little bit, but but Mark, will you go ahead and introduce yourself, former uh, Vanilla WoW team lead? Yeah. Sure. Uh, my name is Mark Kern. I was the uh, shipping lead on World of Warcraft Vanilla, and I also uh, worked on Nostalrius's petition to get Classic WoW and um, helped deliver the petition in person to Mike Morheim. That's what I promised. I said, hey, I worked for Mike. Uh, Mike was my direct boss during World of Warcraft development, and I hand delivered the petition to him uh, and had a, a, a I promised it would be a private conversation, several mm -hmm. hours about the difficulties and the pros and cons of getting uh, WoW back into circulation. And of course, I was very pro, and Mike played devil's advocate and asked me a lot of hard questions, which was a, a good thing to do when you're mm -hmm. when you're being this careful about something that's as classic as WoW, and, and you want to make sure that the quality is very high. So on the project, I basically, I, did, I wore a lot of hats because it started off the, the team lead of uh, projects before then were really responsible for um, organization and management of the team, making sure that the game is uh, not just um, you know uh, efficiently run, but uh, also that it's fun and that it's Blizzard quality, and that we're we're getting it out to to everybody. But they, it grew because WoW was the first time that we went from a box game to a service, and mm. we had to grow the company dramatically in many different areas. We had to create a whole new. Uh, GM system. We had to create a whole new, all these divisions. Um, so my role expanded over time, and I was eventually going around all the way down to educating, going to our sales teams and doing huge conferences in Palm Springs with a worldwide sales team about how do you sell an MMO? And I kept, and I remember there was this barrier. They were thinking about box sales and not about how to um, sell this as an ongoing service and how to get more customers in and reduce churn. And I had to like sort of changed that whole mindset. And that was a new experience for me because I was, I was just, you know, just doing game stuff before then. Right. Um, but in, in the early days, you know, I, I had a lot of fun because the team was small. I got to do things like set out some, like the basic uh, WoW quest template design. I wrote up a doc of the 12. I don't know if that's in your book. I wrote up a doc of the 12. Oh, yeah you know, quest templates and circulated around. And Alan was like, this is this is good stuff. We should we should look at this. <laughs> yeah. And then early UI design, uh, mini map design, all that stuff. But th I love that stuff. And unfortunately, towards the end of WoW, it was more like being a mini CEO uh, running around all these divisions. I literally had two Blackberries on me the whole time because oh, yeah. there were fires <laughs> all the time. Yeah. And um, I remember, you know, Mike chewing me out one night saying um the servers were down where were you and i had had dinner for an hour <laughs> I, yeah. and i hadn't had no sleep and i was very upset and i said mike i i have to have some kind of life we need a fallback plan i, I you know i can't be solely responsible I'm, I'm running with two two blackberries right now um and and i was i remember being pretty upset because i was like i just took an hour or two for dinner and everything went up went went crazy during that time unfortunately <laughs> uh it was a very tense moment you know launching yeah. wow it was it was make it or break it for blizzard mm -hmm. yeah. so and... so one of those 12 quest templates was the escort quest wasn't it uh, i'm sorry <laughs> oh my god <laughs> you did this uh... nobody no we, nobody yeah. thought it was a bad idea at the time right. i don't know i don't remember anybody going i remember a lot of debate over first person versus third person things like that but i don't remember escort quests ever popping up as a, going to be a future problem in anyone's mind. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. the plan was, I don't know why you wrote a, a template for it, because the plan was that the producers were going to make quests in their own time. <laughs> in their own spare time, they would just make a couple quests, and that would be good enough, you know. <laughs> oh, yeah. That would never happen. <laughs> the producers were so busy. I was so busy. In their spare time. <laughs> that's great. Yeah, that spare time evaporated. I mean... I remember doing early itemization, early all the early UI work, um, all the early quest template work, and then that time just evaporated. It was it was completely running around, you know, managing everything and and making some some pretty big decisions like swapping out the animation system at the end, at the very end of the project. That really? was a big risk. Uh, yeah. yeah, because we had so many bugs with the original animation system, and we were we were we were we were pounding on all these bugs, and and we were getting you know. Uh, locked animation states and and things weren't working quite right, and someone was writing 
one of our programmers was writing a completely new animation system. And we, at some point, in, from my experience in project management, Sometimes you're better off rewriting a system than trying to plug a thousand holes in a system that's grown organically over five years um, and, and trying to get that to work. The, the basic instinct is usually to just, hey, we've got something working, let's make it work. But I hedged my bet. I said, okay, you can complete this in parallel. And if you can guarantee me a lower bug rate, we'll do a hot swap and we'll get the new animation system in at the end. So I, I, I authorized a, a, a development in parallel of the old system fixing the bug and the new system that this uh, programmer was making. And it turned out that the, the new system solved a lot of issues. And so we went with that. But yeah, it was really, really tense. I mean, we were, we were the black sheep project uh, of the company. So especially in the beginning. Well, just for, just for my own curiosity, what other Blizzard products you said prior to WoW you, you were with Blizzard? What other games did you work on prior to WoW? Uh, StarCraft, and I helped cancel WarCraft Adventures. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, that was the board game, right? No, WarCraft Adventures was going to be an adventure game. Wasn't and... that like a hyper card type of, you know, click? Well, if you remember the LucasArts games, like... Yeah. Day of the Tentacle and Full Throttle. Full Throttle. It was really yeah. inspired by Full Throttle. These sort of yeah. graphic adventures that you would go through that were click and point. And this was being outsourced by Blizzard to a um, uh, a Russian outsourced company. And mm -hmm. when I came in, one of the first things I had to do was look at this game because I was I, I was a huge adventure game fan. That was that was my my jam back then. So. Um, you know, I said, okay, we've got to completely rewrite this. And I got Steve Moretzky from Infocom. He's a, he was a big uh, text adventure writer back then and graphic adventure writer. And I brought him in and we sealed ourselves in a room with Bill Roper and um, uh, Chris Miller. And we, we rewrote all the entire, all the puzzles, all the quests, all the jokes, everything else for, for three days. We didn't leave that room. We just sealed ourselves in. But when it came time to implement it, we were having issues with our third party and they're long gone, so I can talk about this now. We had issues with, with the third party implementing these changes. And, and this is when I learned one of my, my rules was always look at the source code. You know, if you're having problems with the game, uh, you know, you can, you can look at the code and see where you really are because you can fake a lot of stuff. So I went into the source code and I was horrified because the code was basically copy and pasted over a thousand different environments <laughs> in the game, which meant if you wanted to change in the way inventory worked on the beginning of the game, you had to make it in a th the same change in a thousand different places to get it to work at the end of the game. And that causes a lot of bugs and slowdowns and everything else. And I realized at that point that we were, we were going to have a lot of difficulties getting the quality bar that we wanted out from that. So uh, Warcraft Adventures, you know, I went to Bill Roper. I was like, we got to pull the plug. We just got to pull the plug on this. And um, so I was producer on that. Uh, Diablo 2, also I was uh, Blizzard HQ producer on. The game swallowed my soul. Um, okay, okay. And, and millions of others, I'm sure. <laughs> I led uh, strike teams on that, and I led strike teams on um, StarCraft and, and um, uh, Brood War. And what, do you, what do you mean exactly 64. by strike team? Yeah. I don't know if they do this anymore, and we didn't do it for WoW. WoW was probably the first game I remember us not doing it. But a strike team was actually a team that was picked um, a different perspectives throughout the company different people of uh game playing ability and everything else and we would submit design feedback because we felt that the teams themselves would be too close to it so we picked people from other teams or from the uh, you know or who weren't in in management positions um and i ran these strike teams that would when we did we'd play the game exhaustively and generate tons of feedback like diablo you know we probably uh, Diablo 2, we probably shouldn't have the paladin eating uh, hearts and internal organs of his slain enemies to, <laughs> to, to revitalize health. I mean, this was the way that health regeneration worked in D2. Wow. And we just didn't, you know, thematically, we're like, I, I don't think this is going to work. And and so uh, so that's what strike teams did. And for a while, we, we didn't have one. I think that we just ran out of time. There was so much to do. And it it invented it eventually just absorbed the whole company to, to get this game out. And right. so, um, but that's what, that's what strike teams did. For sure. For sure. Uh, so 
you know, you, you, you were obviously with Blizzard for a long time uh, beforehand, before WoW, you know, came to fruition. Um, how closely did you guys work together, uh, you know, just directly while, uh, while you guys were working on WoW? Oh, John and I? Mm-hmm. Pretty closely. Yeah. Yeah, I remember coming to your office and sitting yeah, down and, and doing feet. this a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <John>. Was... <laughs> <laughs> Mark interviewed actually. Mark interviewed me. You were uh, you were recruiting even uh, like it, while I, I remember talking to you. You were the first face I saw. We um, had to build the WoW team, and we didn't. I didn't believe in. I knew I needed. Okay, so one of the one of the things going against WoW was this. Um, I, John, I don't know if you were here. Do, do you know how the story out how WoW was going to be canceled? Uh, tell us that story. I didn't. Uh, no. Okay. So we we had um, uh, another team lead at the time, and we had another team lead on on team two, working on Warcraft three, and they, and and the WoW team, you know, I was. I had gone from producer of those other titles and I was now manager of product development. So I was responsible for training all our producers and overall, you know, getting all of our projects um, spun up and, and to completion. And the WoW team was coming to me. I wasn't directly on the WoW team at the time. And they were coming to me uh, because they were getting a lot of complaints from other teams. Like this the game would never work. Um, you know, it's uh, it's too confusing. You know, the the art style is different. It didn't look anything like Warcraft's art style at the time, um, and we had a lot of issues to solve there. And so they were already sort of on the ropes as far as a project was going. And a small, a very small team at the time. I think it was ten people. And what happened was the two leads left to form, along with our VP of Tech, left to form ArenaNet to do Guild Wars. Mm. Uh, and we oh. had this giant sucking sound of leadership in the company and everyone was sort of panicked and they um they called a big meeting and i remember i was there with mike and um uh, alan adham the other founder of the company and and frank and um i think pardo was there too and shane and so there's like five of us in in mike's office and everyone everyone around us is saying we've got to cancel the game we can't no. go on there's no way we we don't have enough Blizzard Blue on the project. We talked a lot about you know people who bleed Blizzard Blue who have been you know trained up through the system that are Blizzard veterans that understand our values of game mm -hmm. design and game game production, and uh, and they said and we don't have we don't have a, a technical lead or a team lead, and I said uh. look um, you know at, at Shane can be team lead because you know Shane was the first team lead for for WoW. Uh, at that point after it and i said shane can be team lead and as far as the technical person uh out you know and and the staff the triple a staff that you want to do this i'll go find them i'll find them myself and alan adham said if you can find a new te technical lead for world of warcraft who understands networking enough to do this game and oh. loves mmos oh. i yeah. will buy you dinner mm -hmm. <laughs> i will buy you dinner that was so WoW basically was, was hinging upon motivating some guy to go out and find a new lead programmer and motivating him with dinner. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> which is par for the budget, you know, <laughs> for, yeah. for it, a lot of WoW. It, it's so uh, crazy efforts. to me like to, to think that WoW like, might have possibly been canceled and to see how, how yeah. big of a game that it's grown into today. Yeah, well, it, it, yeah, it, it was it was going to be canceled, and um, until I went out and and I personally recruited John Cash from ID Software, and as far as networking goes, he helped invent the old Novell IPX networking protocol, and he was an EverQuest fiend. Mm -hmm. yeah. So um, the the real barrier to that was convincing his wife to move again because they they had bought two homes and moved twice. So I went out home shopping, and I got brochures and everything else, and. And then I knew John liked to drive BMW M3s, and I had an M3, so we'd talk about our passion for M3s. I did everything I could. I said, yeah. Come on, John. And he's like, hey, I've got to make the wife happy, too. I was like, here's some gorgeous houses that I found, you know. And I went out on my weekends house shopping and um, finally convinced John to come meet the team. And he sat down with, and the interview goes both way. The team has to be okay with John. The John's got to be okay with the team. And they just clicked. And John is such a nice guy that it just it just went really, really smoothly after that. And then 
Blizzard felt like they had, okay, we've got a toehold here. We've got, we've got Shane as team lead. We've got John Cash. You can't ask for a better networking programmer because he was like lead on Quake 3. Uh, he was a uh, tech lead on Quake 2, but I mean, Quake 2. he wrote their network code. I mean, yeah. what game had better network code ever than, well, just id Software, all their games, their network code was just genius. I mean, yep. So the next step after that was proving we could build a AAA team. And so I, you know, I, I, I told HR, it's like, send me every resume. Don't filter it for me. I never direct filtered anything. I looked at every single resume. Um, I did a lot of the hiring at Blizzard at the time. Every even Cinematics team, I went through all their reels and and would say, "Hey, you should really look at this guy. Uh, give this guy a shot. Take a look at him." Uh, people like Jeff Chamberlain and stuff. And um, so, you know, a lot of it was proving that we could get this team. And I, I would say there was a little Blizzard arrogance um, going on at the time because I remember I brought in an artist who worked at Square Enix. We had a couple mm -hmm. of guys that worked on uh, at Square Enix, you know, massive console titles. But some people on our team didn't really know consoles that well. And so in the middle of the interview, uh, our art director, Bill Petrus, goes, I see you've worked on a lot of games, but have you ever worked on a AAA game before? And my face oh. just blanched. <laughs> <laughs> like, Thanks, Bill. Um, <laughs> I was like, Bill, Bill, Final Fantasy is a AAA game. <laughs> <laughs> and... Um, and, and and I say this, it's just just on console, and so um, so yeah, we had we had to overcome that. We had to build a whole team that was non-Blizzard inside a Blizzard division. And the other critique was, from the outside, Blizzard's never made an MMO before. We got a lot of people saying they'll never succeed because they've never made this type of game before. I remember being at E3, and John, do you remember the fake out we did for E3 on the UI? Um, I know we used like old co code on the UI, right? Yeah, we yeah. used. You're... Yeah, yeah. Do you remember why we did that? Uh, th was this before? We kept our UI under wraps uh, for a while. Was this before EverQuest uh, welcomed uh, Alan Adham and showed him, gave him a preview of the UI that they were that they just told him that they had stolen from our announcement uh, magazines that they had seen something yep. and they just, um, they didn't mind telling them oh yeah we just stole it from you we're going to ship your your ui before you're going to actually you oh know, my god yeah. i got into i got into an argument with john smedley a couple years later about that i said I, I accused him of always taking our ideas like our ui as well as you know uh griffin rides you know eq2 suddenly had griffin rides of their own um, all the way to some stuff we were working on on, on Firefall when he was doing Planet Side Two, and we'd given him and given him ins inside investor pitches. Now, you know there there are tense moments in gaming, but you know I love John. John's a great guy, great dev. I I, I think we inspire each other, but we were very competitive. <laughs> so before E3 came out, and I don't remember if this was before or after John said this. Probably after. We rolled back our ui code we had yeah. a brand new ui we had all these you know the, everything that we were going to ship with and we rolled it back to prior versions right. for e3 so that our competition couldn't copy the new ui we did this deliberately and you know and my how we got to this point i think is we were talking about people saying we couldn't do this i remember being at e3 and showing off the game and there were eq devs standing behind us and they were just they'd be here like looking with a cocked eye and <laughs> snickering and laughing at us. And, and, the, and that was a little hard to take, you know, but we were, we were like, we could do this, you yeah. know, we could do this. And, um, but there was a lot of doubt and I was reading the comments on every screenshot. People would diss us for the, the being low poly and we were, yeah. We were, yeah. We were being so aggressive on the poly counts because there was a split in the industry at the time. I was looking at the hardware stats going Intel screwed us people are going what do you mean they're coming out with integrated graphics and this is going to sweep um penetration in the marketplace and w and we can't run on that and mike was like we got to run on it we got to run on everything blizzard always tries to run on everything and we tried and we tried but the, the chipset wasn't powerful enough at the time and i finally said mike we, we can't do it and unfortunate and this led to us thinking that wow wasn't it was part of the reason why we thought wow wasn't going to sell very well Really? Do you remember of any graphic? of this? Yeah. Oh, totally. Mark, you know, I got to uh, 
that was a 2002 E3. I actually cover all the E3s in my book. Each one, it's it, the two. It there was a payoff in 2003. Actually, when we showed the Griffin rides, my first walk into the Blizzard area, and the, I, I I talk about this in my book, was expletives coming from EverQuest uh, designers, raging that he told the uh programmers that air taxis were actually possible okay and his programmers had said no it's impossible <laughs> so now he's walking in here and he's saying look these it, it, and we knew the reason why it was bad frame rate okay but we hid our bad frame rate we kept our uh griffin rides if you remember we stayed out of the, the alleys between or, or between the zones where there was too many textures like loading from both uh, uh, the both the, the zones at the same time. But that's one of the things that we were able to just one up them on. Is, uh, <laughs> but yeah, I thought that was a funny streaming yeah. speed. We're worried about streaming those textures oh. over hard drives. Yeah. You know, and getting them into memory fast enough to for the speed of Griffin rides. But uh, but yeah, no, that was. That was, you know, that was something we were like, "Hey, where'd they get taxis from?" Now I, yeah. I don't, I don't actually remember the lead designer going off like that. So. Oh no, no, I could no, no. This was I, I overheard this, like you oh. have to scream into each other's ear. This is at E3. This is at E3. His first reaction to the game was seeing Griffins. He and. I mean expletives, okay? <laughs> Those programmers told we couldn't do taxis in the air. We could have done this. We could have come out with this before. We're shooting before them. This is ridiculous. You know, he was absolutely and, – and probably one reason why he's yelling is because he's – that the volume, the decibel volume is uh, – E3 actually – I actually researched this and 110 uh, vo uh, decibels is – that's that's what e3 go goes to and and back in the days they, they they regulated it later on but he had to shout into the ear of the person next to him i was i just happened to be right behind i didn't know he was you know everquest until he turned around i saw the badge so that was a funny yeah. discovery that's hilarious honestly and like just hearing that hearing how wow basically hinged upon like one hiring basically and like a dinner bet and like just all the competition between like you guys and EverQuest, it seems like one thing Blizzard is very complimented on, especially today, is like creative liberty that they give to their employees and stuff like that. When it comes to World of Warcraft, was it like a very kind of hierarchical, you know, rigid management like structure, or did they kind of allow you guys just to, did Mike allow you guys just like run loose and kind of do your own thing and pull it off? I guess uh, to you, Mark and. Yeah, Mark would know that more than me. I mean, between like working under Mark and Shane, yeah. uh, it, was, it was remarkably little um, depth in management. Like they hired the right people, and mm -hmm. Mark was good at that. He, he used once he had John Cash. Okay, he introduced John Cash to all the pr prospective employees that he really wanted to hire. So he mm -hmm. used the star power of John Cash to like recruit people. But uh, no. At least working under Mark and Shane, uh, it was there's they, they hired the right people and they trusted us to make the game. But I don't know how much, like how was Mike and Paul and um, Frank? Well, this is where having some perspective uh, and maturity later uh, versus being younger on the WoW team has really sort of opened my eyes. You know, a lesson that I learned. I was um, probably actually, you know, I had a lot of issues with um trying to get wow made at an at a upper management level and 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 some arguments i got into with mike and frank about this and um i didn't realize at the time just how much rope they gave me to hang myself with and the team how much freedom they gave us i didn't appreciate that at the time until later on i was a ceo and everybody else and you were <laughs> right. worrying about these risks yeah. so yeah. so they gave you guys of like a lot of creative freedom totally and yeah, and awesome. you don't appreciate that when you're a rebellious teenager out to change the world you know i, I don't think you appreciate that so if, if mike is watching this i just want to say 
I'm sorry I was such an asshole teenager <laughs> about that. And I really appreciate now awesome. the amount of freedom yeah. and flexibility he gave the whole team, Shane and myself. I mean, uh, it was it, it's incredible that we had this latitude. I remember going into Vivendi's board of directors because they were very concerned with how much this project was costing. And, you know, and this is a, a giant board of a, a huge multinational company at the time. And um, I didn't understand how difficult this task was going to be. But after the presentation, I, sh I showed the board, you know, the demo and I walked them through everything. The board members would come around me and they would like put their hand on my shoulder and push down really hard. And I would look the board member in the eye and go, um, well, what was that for? And he's like, you have a lot to bear. I just want to see if you can do it. And, oh. um, <laughs> and I, I, I had no realization at the time of the significance uh, of the project to blizzard or to vivendi's eventual success but they had they they saw something i didn't right. and um and i have to admit that that you know in in my arguments with mike sometimes i was a bit of a jerk about that i, I wanted freedom for the team i wanted you know all this stuff you always feel like you know you're ruining my life <laughs> you know? yeah. 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 yeah and 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 when, later when i became a ceo of my own and everything else i i I totally appreciate that now. That's awesome. So. <laughs> that's so awesome. Yeah, yeah that's we that's had really we had cool. a lot of freedom that we didn't realize we had, and a lot of risk and responsibility that we didn't. Maybe it's good that we didn't see it because I think we've been scared to death. <laughs> yeah. It allowed you to take risks, you know. Yeah, Fine. I think yeah. I think so. It's mm -hmm. probably good that we didn't see it. So I know. Uh, so when yeah. sorry, I was I was gonna say so. Just, just to touch on this, when WoW was sort of, uh, its fate was more rocky, when it was sort of more on the cutting board, you didn't know if it was going to work out or not. Were you guys thinking of any ideas like a StarCraft MMO or, or anything else like the Diablo MMO? They were bouncing around internally. Well, John probably has more insight on this. I only remember a couple discussions. I remember we picked the wrong game we should, because no one can tell the difference between Warcraft 3 and World of Warcraft. This was the thing. This was the really? thing internally, because Warcraft Three has heroes that you level. Wow has heroes that you level. Warcraft Three has a camera that can go over the shoulder. Wow has an over-the-shoulder camera. I can't tell the difference between these two games. People would say <laughs> internally. Really? What's the difference? I mean, what's the fundamental difference? It's like, well, it's the multiplayer aspect and the RPG aspect. It's like we've got stats in, in Warcraft Three. We've got leveling. You know, we've got items and. Uh, and for, for this was an argument we had to, to fight over over and again. We, and, well, what should we do instead? It's like, well, if you really want to hit the casual mass market, and Eric Dodds would say this a lot. Mark, I think we should have gone with Diablo. We should have made Diablo the MMO instead. And third person, uh, not third person, but three-quarter perspective screen and, and, and click and point. We should have done that. And, you know, he wasn't wrong. If you look at the success of Lineage in Korea and other games right. that adopted that Diablo style. Yeah. Um, but um, but we there was so much doubt. <laughs> there was so much doubt. Um, another one was we should have done The Sims Online. We should have done something like that, um, where it's much more mass appeal. And the reason why, uh, WoW is not going to sell as much is because of several factors. One is your graphics requirements are too high. You can't run on Intel integrated graphics. Um, you need an online connection. Only X percent of our customers are online. You need a credit yeah. card to play. You know, uh, so let's take Warcraft 3 sales and start chipping away because Warcraft 3 is very accessible mm -hmm. or sorry, Warcraft 2 or, or Starcraft or whatever and start chipping away. It's like, OK, let's reduce it 33 percent for requiring online. Let's reduce it another 33 percent for requiring a credit card for your, your mom and dad. OK, well, it's third of a much uh, as any of our other games. And right. how are we going to justify the cost, the extreme cost of this project if we're only going to make a third of the money? That was a, a huge, yeah. huge risk. Yeah, I, I remember the first day I was on at WoW, they were showing me what the game looked at like. I think the the build had broken, and the only uh, <laughs> only machine that was running it was the demo machine out in the hallway. And Shane saw that, you know, Shane and and, and uh, John Cash uh, were came up to meet me and. I think Eric was showing me or someone was showing me the uh, exterior terrain or something. And Shane started to explain how, how wow might work in that 
if you want to quest and you know go out and run around in the zone and uh, solo, you would just play locally on your machine. And that's smart because it saves the bandwidth, okay? Because we were absolutely nuts about sh saving our, our, our bandwidth money because we were EverQuest apparently had terrible, terrible uh, efficiency with their, uh, with their network code. And so a lot of their money actually got lost and chewed up by bandwidth costs. So while Shane is explaining this to me, John Cash is standing behind him and he's going, <laughs> and he, he's just shaking his head and, and very comically just shaking his head and I start smiling. Uh -huh. And as, as Shane is talking, he's like, what, what? And he turns around and uh, John says, no, we can't do that. We can't, we can't leave all that stuff on the client. I mean, anything that anything on the client can be hacked. And that means uh, AI, uh, pathing, like the items. We can't put any of that right. online. That ha that has to be kept on the server. And so Shane says, "Well, we'll not have you know single player like fight." And, and Sean's like, "John's <laughs> nope, no." Nope. And he turns, and now Shane, okay, team lead at the time, he turns around and goes. Well, I guess we won't do it that way. I just wish every decision was that easy to make. <laughs> well, I, I think it's so interesting, like, just thinking about, like, games 15 years ago, 14 years ago, and how, you know, the concept of, like, not having single player seems so foreign, especially, like, with Blizzard games, you know, like, like you said, like, you have so much of, a, of the player base who, you know, doesn't use Battle.net, doesn't play online, they, they just play the campaign, they play single player. I don't know, I think that's so cool to think about, how, like, yeah. how... I mean, it's it's really it's it's a part of gaming history. World of Warcraft is uh, it's a big part of gaming history, and um, it wasn't the only game, but th there were a lot of games around that time, you know, and, and even a, f a few MMOs prior that really started to make the uh, online only play a little bit more mainstream. And I think that's so awesome. Yeah, that's it's funny. It's funny you guys mention server side hacks and client side hack, or sorry, uh, client side hacks. Um, that was a big problem. I remember back in the day with Diablo two online, like that was a very big problem. So it was a wise choice. <laughs> Yeah, I um, I learned a lot from Diablo 2 because I had to, I was sitting down with Adrian. Adrian left designing the server infrastructure on the hardware networking side for that. And we didn't know much at the time. So I remember frantically reading networking books and counting bytes and TCP IP frames and everything else. And um, just, you know, debating layer two switching versus layer three switching. This was all new at the time. And when we did wow we, uh, i was like okay we have john and I, I would have long conversations with john about how to approach this and how to avoid the pitfalls of what we went through on diablo 2 um architecture for the the server and networking side but yeah running everything server side was also you know something that we were very adamant about we didn't want any of the duping bugs that we had in d2 we didn't want to deal with yeah. any of the, the trusting the client issues and so we were very very religious about that and John and his team came up with a very clever way to eliminate the risk of duping bugs um, that other people hadn't used at the time. And so that was that was great. And, you know, um, and that saved us a lot of headache. But I do remember thinking some things would be easy that I mocked other games for. Um, <laughs> what? Nice slice uh, of humble pie, huh? Oh, <laughs> so much, so yeah. much humble pie. We were... Uh, um, I used to I used to laugh at how EverQuest would get boats so wrong because whenever you took the boat in EverQuest to cross zones, and back then they made it where it was a 20 minute or half an hour boat ride to get from one zone to another, Whoa. but they had bugs where th when you're transferring between on a boat between two servers, a lot can go wrong. The connection between the servers can drop. The, the the character as it transitions from the memory of one machine to another one can drop, and I said. Uh, how can you not get boat rides right? It seems so simple. How can you not get that right? We're not going to have any problem with boats. And of course, when we launched, we had so many problems with boats and people dropping connections to everything else. And so, yeah, there was some stuff I thought that was going to be tremendously easy that turned out to be really difficult later. And so whoever did the boats in EQ, I'm sorry, I mocked it. It's really hard to do. <laughs> and uh, and you're really smart for figuring it out. <laughs> I'm just thinking of people getting feared on boats. Oh my goodness. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. Bad. And um, uh, sorry, sorry, tips. No, no, well, go I was ahead. just gonna, I was gonna say, speaking of like, just like network issues and stuff like that, 
Um, there's a big kind of like contention now when it comes to vanilla in particular about like server population sizes and stuff like that. And I think, uh, John, you told us last week that that server sizes were around like 2,500 concurrent players or something. And I think, Mark, you've, you've kind of shed light about that in a tweet uh, a while back. Was there any particular reason why you guys chose that population concurrent cap? Was it technical? Was it just this is how much players we think should be in the world? Or, or was it kind of like, you know, just like, yeah, that's all we can support at this time from back end? And I guess so we'll start with John. Oh, God. Uh, I know. I can't imagine it was a design uh, decision. I th it would have to be a tech technical uh, limitation. limitation. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it wasn't. It, no, right, it was well. entirely driven by design. Ironically yeah. enough. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Really? Because, well, wait, uh, wait. We're talking. Are we talking post-launch cap on concurrency, or are we talking no. about our initial uh, server ideas? Our goal for population of servers and why what's we, design yes yeah it was designed later on was technical oh, yeah i was like we, we can't do more than this right from a cost perspective um you want to get as many players onto a server as you can you don't want a lot of empty cycles sitting around mm -hmm. um where, where you can shove a player in and and utilize the electricity and the and the bandwidth and everything else um but alan adam was very adamant about communities and um servers and he very much wanted um a a world where you it was like the bars and cheers where everybody knows your name <laughs> and you see the same uh, names absolutely. running by over and over again absolutely. so that you would form these social bonds you'd be like i know that guy i've seen him before and so he wanted he wanted even smaller sizes on servers really and okay, okay. uh when we shipped the servers were actually running okay. Um, we had a bottleneck in, on the back end. Uh, I can't go too much in detail about it, but we had a bottleneck that was on the back end that, that caused us far more headaches. Um, and so we had server caps and soft caps, but we were trying to get it as low as possible. And I was trying to find the right balance between cost and, and everything else to, to do this and to build a community at the same time. And I have to say that's one aspect I really miss from MMOs. And including modern WoW is the loss of that feeling of community, and I think Alan was was very right in that respect, and that you you do trade something off for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that is definitely the biggest appeal of Vanilla WoW is is the way that it fosters and encourages and reinforces Absolutely. player interaction and community. Yeah, but I know that a lot of um, uh, I know that Nostalrius and other realms ran much higher counts and um on their servers and i remember seeing screenshots of lines yeah. for, for certain quests and it and that actually seemed to build their communities so that's an example that goes in a completely opposite direction where wow. it feels like there's a lot of activity you're yeah. in a bustling city almost and hey everyone's here this is really popular and so i want to keep playing i don't care if there's a line versus that sort of tight-knit you know community that alan had really wanted uh for for world of warcraft yeah, I'm, I'm excited to see what they, uh, one of our classic releases, what they decide to go with as far as like population cap and stuff. I think that's been a big topic of discussion for both of those reasons. Like I, I know for me, like I, I like the, uh, the concept of having a big server and there's just, to me, that's more people to meet. But for some people having too big of a server is, uh, it's, it's almost overwhelming and, and you don't really see the same face twice. So kind of like, uh, Adam said, so, um, kind of speaking of classic a little bit. You're you're familiar with the dev water cooler update they gave out a few months ago. It it was it the the one and only update on classic. Yeah, 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 yeah. that's the one. Yeah, yeah, I read it. Um, so basically, like with your guys' like development background, is it typical to give like a 100% current progress update? Uh, as because they said they're on their third prototype, uh, so far. Right, they said they're on their third prototype so far. They've they've gone through two different iterations of how they were, you know, looking at doing classic. Uh, my speculation was that you know this is what they're willing to tell us so far. It could even be possible that they're farther along than what they're saying, but I don't know what's what's typical like in the industry. Is that like? John, More do you news. want to? Uh, I, yeah. I speculate. Well, I, I, I don't know anything, so it's easy for me to speculate. Uh, <laughs> Blizzard was kind of forced. Yeah, it, it's kind of weird. Well, in my experience, uh, they've always 
shown what they can guarantee. Like if they're not sure if they've got, if they see uh, thin ice ahead, they're not going to say, Oh, everything's good. You know, they've been bitten right. in the, in the butt so many times with Warcraft three. I think they're paranoid about showing too much unless they're absolutely sure that they can actually, you know, I think that's reasonable with it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. But that that's all I know. I mean, that's Blizzard always plays her cards close to the chest. Mm -hmm. And um so is is the question more about like how far along they are or what does third prototype mean or well, No, I, I meant more in terms of like if, if a company is usually willing to say like, Okay, we're we're this is what they're willing to show us so far, is that more of or this is what they're showing us so far, is that more of something that they're willing to show us based on uh, they might be farther along, or is it, you know, is it more common to just like 100% give you a current progress update? I think Blizzard tends to be more conservative, mm -hmm. probably a little farther along. Other companies that want a lot of PR will go bleeding edge, and yeah. so, and what you see is what you get. It's literally hot off the dev servers, you know, and they they push that line really hard. Mm -hmm. I see, I saw that time and time again, competing against these guys, and you know. That uh, they would they would drop their latest and greatest, and we were always holding something back, like how we rolled the UI back, how we did all this. We were always playing it conservative. I don't know if that's the way it is now. Um, you know, maybe um, you know Blizzard is farther uh, is is isn't as far as head as as I would I think they are. Third prototype sounds really good. It sounds like they got something, and I think I read in that update that they found a way to quickly bootstrap the old servers up. And connect it up to their existing infrastructure, which is a good sign that mm -hmm. they did something. It sounded like they did something really clever, and just from the way they said it and the, the speech patterns, I was like, it sounds like they they found a quick way, a quick way to to get this okay. up and running. Yeah. But most of the work at Blizzard, the it's done when it's done is the final polish, and that's yeah. the part that takes the longest. So even if they've got the technology bootstrapped and they've got it running. It could take a long time after that for the polish phase. Right. Yeah. Well, someone's going to have an opinion and they're going to have, well, what happens? See, what I don't know is like, how, how are, oh boy. Yeah. This is, I'm amazed that they're, that, that, that they're doing it. Like, I don't know how they're going to support this for how many years. Like, this is going to be a lot of, this is going to be a big thing. It's a big do. project. Like, yeah. Very big project. Blizzard doesn't do small games. Okay. Hearthstone was remarkable in that Eric Dodds and his, his team was able to get it through all the, the hoops inside Blizzard, convincing them that, yes, you can do a small game at Blizzard, but for an MMO, I don't know if they're willing to just say, okay, yeah, you saw here's Here's a 15 year old game. Here it is. Right, you know, right. I don't. Yeah. I just don't know, especially when so many devs are so creative and they want to have their own, you know, ideas and they want to try their own stuff out. I don't know. I. I it's that's the great fear in the classic community right now. I absolutely. Just how far will totally. they go with the changes? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Where do you stop? I have a feeling. I feel. I have a feeling they have to be aware that if they push too many changes, they just alienate everyone that was interested in the first I, place. I think they're really aware at this point. Like especially after yeah. that that update. Um, they said they want to give as, as much of an accurate vanilla feel and, and representation of what the original game was as possible. Um, so I, I don't know, for me, the, the dev update was, was really, really encouraging. Um, and especially seeing like, you know, third prototype, like that sounds good. Like, oh, I'm, I'm not a, I'm not a programmer, but that sounds good to me. Right. So <laughs> I like that. And, uh, also them saying like, kind of, kind of being very transparent and saying like, what are the different, uh, things they're looking at and how they're changing the spell system, like un under the hood type of changes as opposed to changes to the gameplay or the mechanics and stuff like that. Um, I, I thought that was cool that they're being very transparent with that. Yeah. yeah, it was nice to get something after like six or seven months of silence, but now we're all sitting here right now kind of holding our breath for the next event on the horizon, which is yeah, BlizzCon. BlizzCon, baby. Do you, do you guys think we'll get anything big? Mark, do you think uh, something's coming for us or... Who knows? Who who knows? Uh, I think it's too early still. That's my gut talking. But, you know, we have no idea how many people are on it. We don't know, you know, um, how polished third prototype is or if internally they want to 
because I know they're very, very concerned about quality. This is an old game, right? And it has to, I know that they feel that it has to up not just to the quality of the past, but the present quality of Blizzard products. If you want to do that before you show it, I think it, it, it's going to take some time. I think there's going to be a lot of internal discussion about what to do with the graphics, what to do with, you know, some elements of the gameplay and, you know, integration and everything else. And that's going to, that's going to take some time. They, it's such a gem in the Blizzard crown. I don't think they would just say, hey, look, you know, we've got old WoW running. I think they would really want something special to show. And if that's the case, you know, um, I, I don't think you'd see anything at BlizzCon. But who knows? Yeah, it could be really far along. We, you, you're Breaking talking about it. You tips out. You're talking about an MMO, okay? Yeah. And I, I kind of chuckled to myself when you said six months of silence, okay? When you're talking about <laughs> developing an MMO, six months, <laughs> six months is just nothing. like, yeah. oh my god! I mean, <laughs> like, like, how long were we in from the friends and family alpha? The, I mean. Holy moly! It, 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 there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of cooks in the kitchen too. Yeah. So. See, we're the we're <laughs> no, the angsty teenagers fair. now. <laughs> so yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> they, they're also not rebuilding everything with art and sound from the ground up, right? So they, they do have a foundation that will, I think, speed it along. When when you think. Yeah, content was was always interesting, and I don't know if you, John, do you have a you have the quote in the book about um, eating my hat if 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 code holds up shipping this game versus art oh boy no i don't have that one uh, okay that was that was colin right yeah i'll yeah that's right okay every blizzard game up to that point has has been held up by um i guess you know art and design and yeah. final polish and all the bugs yeah. are hammered out <laughs> that was so programming <laughs> and they were oh. so sure because colin you know old school blizzard program was so sure that code was never going to hold up shipping this game yeah and uh and in fact what happened was code code was neck and neck with art and design oh, yeah yeah we shipped a cd that did not work the build was broken yeah the only thing that worked was the patcher <laughs> yeah. so it was a day it was day one patch in order to get that thing running the game did not work and physical media meant we had to get it all on disc ahead of time in order to get it on store shelves in time so yeah, so I, that was that was a, a change with Blizzard too. That was the first time that the the technology was so difficult. You got to remember, nobody knew how to do massive scaling of MMOs at the time. There wasn't social media. Nobody did web websites at huge scale. The only thing you could look at was the stock market and how it operated, and and banks and things like this. And um, so we had to learn this all from scratch. And we had to sort of invent it on the fly and make a lot of mistakes. And so uh, it was the first time that I think that, that technology was just as much of a holdup as art and design on a Blizzard project at that time. Wow. Yeah, and I also quoted Colin twice already in my book. So <laughs> okay. apparently he's a very quotable person. So uh, yeah, I held him to two. He never did eat his hat. There were a lot of bets that were <laughs> Oh that yeah. He was supposed to eat his hat. <laughs> <laughs> and if we reached, what was it, 1 million subs, Shane was supposed to get a tattoo of the logo on his forehead? Was that what it was? <laughs> yeah. People did and not believe. Yeah. We had so many bets that I think, you know, that that, that never got resolved. There's a lot of... Um, <laughs> so yeah. when, WoW, when WoW came out, your competitors, Dayok and EverQuest, what, were, what was the highest MMO sub count at that point before WoW came out? Do you, do you remember? EQ was 500,000. Five hundred thousand, okay. And that was our that was our target. Yeah, and if we can do that. We'll be okay. <laughs> and, and I think you guys you beat it by a little bit. You know, just, just a little, little bit. bit. Yeah. But their concurrency was like fifteen or twenty percent. It was really low. And our we we speculated. And I if correct me if I'm wrong. We speculated. Okay, we can handle maybe double what their highest concurrency was, which is fifteen percent so we was like 30 40 and then when when november came along um i was talking to joe he said we had like 90 percent concurrency or some like 70 to 90 or something crazy concurrency so it was kind of hard to actually compare the two well 
Yeah, you had a lot yeah. of very addicted gamers. Yeah. Ninety percent concurrency. Yeah. Well, it was also yeah. thanks. It was Thanksgiving vacation. That's that's right. right. We I had remember, remember nobody had anything to do other than play World of Warcraft because that's all they were looking forward to do. They would cleared their schedules, and uh, I had a lot to do Thanksgiving. <laughs> yes. I, I spent I spent it at Blizzard instead of with my family. Oh my god! And it was like those, you know whenever you watch a tv show they have a, a christmas or thanksgiving special and maybe it's some hospital drama and all the doctors are snowed yeah. in and they <laughs> they have to they have to put together a meager thanksgiving meal and somehow they still manage to have a warm glowing feeling at the end of it yeah. we had that sort of except without the warm glowing feeling it was more like sheer panic <laughs> as as a bunch of us spent our Thanksgiving trying to trying to rub two sticks together with what we had to get WoW running yeah. because we knew everyone would be playing it over Thanksgiving and we had to keep the servers up. And so we were all losing sleep and I think we did get some turkey brought in or something, but it was very meager and there was no warm, cheery afterglow. It was just like, oh my God! <laughs> <laughs> um, it, was, it, was, it was panic time. But yeah, um, That's great. yeah I did not so... get to play with WoW. For you guys, if you can think of like the one single biggest hurdle you had to overcome with getting WoW up and running, and also, I, I guess, bonus question: What would you imagine the the current Blizzard Classic WoW team? What is their biggest hurdle you uh, that you would speculate on? I would guess hiring. Mm. Hiring. Hiring, getting the right people um, who are passionate about getting a, a a game that's frankly not theirs they can't really they can't say oh you know this is my game you know uh how do you hire good people you you need really good people it's an mmo so you're looking for the very best and you know how are, are they forcing people's hands to go onto the project or maybe it's a nice project that everybody wants to be a part of right. i don't know um it's 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 such a different thing no games, no company's ever done anything like this. It's so, such a weird thing right. to release a product that's already been out, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, RuneQuest did it. RuneScape, RuneScape yeah, they did RuneScape, it. RuneScape, RuneScape. Sorry. Oh, I guess I did. I was thinking of the Avalon game. Never yeah. played. Yeah. RuneScape was a little different because Jagex, the company behind RuneScape, basically in one change and like one sweeping update, they flipped the entire game upside down. And so for like, years afterwards players were like what the heck like in one update the entire combat changed everything with the game changed so they felt like they had to regress but with blizzard it's a little bit different because blizzard multi-billion dollar conglomerate there doesn't seem to be any financial need to do something like this and i think right. that's you know one of the reasons why it's so cool that it happened it's you know i, I definitely wouldn't expect this from any other triple a developer it's it's really cool that they're doing it and um yeah, I think going back to what Stay Safe said, you know, talking about technical challenges, uh, we talked a little bit about this before the call. And, and John, you said uh, creative talent. Like, is there anything on the technical side that we should like be really worried about? Like, oh, this is just you know, it's going to take so long, or you know, what are the things from that end? He's definitely not asking me. <laughs> oh, oh. Yeah. yeah, for the technical end, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's my answer. Yeah. Hmm. Actually, I, I, I don't think I see any huge barrier. In fact, I see a lot of technologies available today that make the job easier. Server virtualization, um, uh, our databases are so much better now. Um, I think you know the the risk uh, from a technology perspective is i think they did talk about this at one point when they said should we do wow or not somebody said oh they they lost something right do you remember that uh what, what do you mean they lost something oh this is more towards the classic cast team john this mm. is something that, oh, that happened okay. All right. the, yeah, I, I remember hearing this. They lost yeah. the source code. Yeah, they yeah. lost the source code or something like that. that. Well, yeah. it wasn't. It wasn't anything specific, right? They didn't say anything. They just said it wasn't. Uh, either way, yeah. Continue. They, they they said there was a technical challenge, right, and yeah. and there was a technical challenge, but I didn't believe it was an insurmountable one with sufficient time and resources, and I thought that there was uh, enough of of both to sort of like, um, you know, to to get this to happen. So looks like they did find it, and they they would not do this if they had not overcome that problem. Yeah, so I think awesome. that the main technical risk is behind us, 
And what you're really looking at now is what are we going to deliver? Is that was probably what they're thinking. And at Blizzard, I think that I agree with John. It's really about does the team believe in this? You have to have true believers to sh to on any of the game projects inside of Blizzard. You know, uh, they want the team has to want to have this to happen. It's not like Blizzard goes, here's the game you will make. You know, team two, here's the game you will make. They don't they don't really do that. They want the team to really be driven by their own passions to make this game because that's how you get the best quality. That's right. how you get the best result. So where do you find that team? Who wants to remake somebody else's game? And not only, you know, do you have to be very careful about interject, you know, there's very little room for your own creativity there, but there's also a very high bar of expectation of what you need to deliver. You're going to be in the hot seat on this. Right. Where, where do you where do you find people willing willing to say, okay, I'm going to suppress my creative vision, you know, and, and because I'm a huge fan of the original and I've got all the technical and art skills and everything else that they need to do this. Like, that's a very unique sort of individual. Uh, right. And you staff a whole team that way that's passionate about recreating the past but are also super talented and yet willing to, you know, put their creativity second to honoring an image of the past that's that's hard to do right you know, if you're if you're very technically competent and you're very you know i suppose on the technical side there's a lot of great challenges like how do we get this old stuff to run mm -hmm. and and to do it quickly and to do it well on the art side and design side that's tougher you know it's like oh well we can't really touch the original graphics or interpret them too much or we can't really redesign this raid encounter, or if we do, we've got to be super, super careful. And nobody's going to like us no matter what we do. If we change one thing, we're going to be in the hot seat on this. You know, that that's kind of a thankless right. job. You know, yeah. um, so I agree with John. I think finding the right motivated team and building that up carefully and staffing it up is is one of the greatest challenges to doing this product well. Here's a question. I have a question. I answered the, uh, I've answered this question many times. I would never want to be on that team. I would yeah. never want to <laughs> an MMO that has such high expectations. There's only a measure of how much you've failed. Okay. Yeah. It's like inheriting the tonight show. Okay. You, right. you don't want to right. inherit okay. the tonight show. Okay. Mark, would you want to, work i mean forget uh, say they meet your price and all that stuff like like would you want to work on this project wow yeah see me that, yeah, no yeah. think no absolutely not there's no way i would want to work on another mmo no way i i think that might be one of those things that just might be hard like once you've already done something and then going back and doing it again yeah i don't know yeah, and done the, something the, for the 10 years. The <laughs> problem with getting the original people to do it is we would want to change stuff. Oh, we absolutely. know where we absolutely. drop the ball. We know where all our skeletons are buried. <laughs> and I don't think we'd be the right people because we, we would not no. be able to resist well, that, no. just just one thing you, you want to go just, try just, and make this better thing. and yeah of course yeah, yeah that brings up that brings up a really big question if you guys could each change one thing about vanilla wow where you think you dropped the ball what would it be i just oh, don't geez. i don't think we did drop like we <laughs> i mean honestly the with the with the challenges up against us it, people keep asking me uh you know, what's the thing you didn't get into the game that you really wanted to get in? Huh. Uh, everything got cut was kind of crappy, okay? <laughs> and sometimes it was by someone else's hand, thank God, that said, no, nah, John, this is not, <laughs> this is not, you don't want to do it. You know, we're not going to move forward with this. Uh, yeah, so I don't think there's really any part that we, I mean, I would have liked to have shipped with, you know pvp but i knew the tech problems that we were we were putting so so many fires out for six months before i even started on pvp uh after we shipped so i mean i can't just pretend that you know everything was rosy and that nobody was complaining on the boards about all these systems that were just on fire after we shipped so right. uh my gosh uh i, I don't think there was a 
Mark, I mean, can you think of anything that we... On the, on the technical side, I have many regrets. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's a bunch of things we would have wished differently on the technical side. On the design side, you know, I think that um, um, it's hard to say because whatever we shipped worked. So, yeah. so we were wrong if we wanted this instead of what we shipped. You know, all the individual thousands, hundreds of thousands of decisions that go into it. And it's really hard to go back and, and change it. But, you know, I, I know that if, if we reassembled the entire WoW team, there were so many different opinions. And if We'd you asked us done. to ship <laughs> nothing WoW, we get nothing arguments. Done. Because oh. even if I'm, like, easygoing about this feature or something else, I, I during development, there'd be a line out my door about people saying we should do it this way or we should do it that way or I don't believe it. Because we had an open door policy. Mm -hmm. you, could, you could talk shit about the game. You didn't like the way it was going in some aspect. Go ahead and talk. You're not going to be, you're not going to be dinged for it. You're not going to be fired for it. You know, it's open door policy. Say whatever you want because all we want is the best goddamn idea out there. Right. And um, and so you know, but but we would just argue endlessly. I mean, there were so many arguments. <laughs> there oh. were people who really thought first yeah. person was the way to go because it's more immersive. Yeah. That first person should really? be the default. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Wow. And every game I worked on, you know, seems to have this debate. I mean, even on, on Firefall, we ended up doing both first and third. And you can switch between them for a shooter, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, but, you know, I think that. But again, in hindsight, you know, you know, I did say it. I did say, oh, we would be tempted to change stuff. But when you ask me, I'm like, how could we like, you know, but I think we would get arguments. We could, we would get arguments, especially with game mechanics right because there's there's stuff that was obviously broken. class balance class balance and things yeah and i think that's where the arguments would be i think that's exactly where the debates right. and arguments would be and and probably they're happening now but since the people involved didn't make the original they're not going to be as passionate about it they're not going to be especially see i told you this would be a problem <laughs> <laughs> and so i've got points and i'm going to spend them on my pet feature over here right <laughs> right Wow, that's great. Yeah. So just just real quick, uh, guys, people who are watching, um, we are going to go into a Q&A session in a little bit. Uh, how we usually do this is we usually check Twitter first, and then we pick stuff out of chat. Uh, afterwards, if you guys want to go ahead and, and follow myself, Tips Out Baby, Stay Safe Warlock on Twitter, uh, and then also feel free to, to follow uh, Tips Out Baby, Stay Safe TV, and, and uh, my own stream as well, of course, on, uh, on Twitch, YouTube. Uh, and then John Stats and, and Grums, John Stats, uh, W-I-R, and Grums on, uh, on Twitter. So uh, if you guys have any questions, tweet it at us, hashtag ClassicCast, and uh, I'll go through in a little bit, and I'll start picking some out, and then we'll move into the chat. Yeah. What do you think, uh, Mark, especially because you met with them, the, the Nostalrius team, um, you know, obviously, uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of appreciation for what the Nost, uh, Nost guys did in, in our community and stuff like that. And since then, we haven't really heard from them. Have you kept tabs with with Viper or Demon or any of those guys? Do you know what they're up to these days? I haven't. I, I have one of the devs, uh, Idiocor, is on my project right now. Um, uh, but we haven't really talked about Classic WoW or anything. Um, and uh, he did he did some of the. Um, the recreating of the the raid boss logic for Nostalrius um, for their servers and um, but I have to say that I was super super impressed when I met them and talked to them. This was this team was so smart and so dedicated and so passionate and with and organized. They were tremendously tremendously organized. I was shocked. More organized than, than the original WoW team, probably. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, uh, and I knew, I said, okay, Blizzard's got to talk to you guys. We got to make this happen. And, you know, I, so I was very, very comfortable going to bat for them and saying, hey, you should, you should really listen to these guys. They have a lot to say. They've done a lot of work here. They, they know what they're talking about. And they're, they're, they're mature and they're organized and they you know and and they've got what it takes to to help make this happen if you if you need any help in this area or that area or you know if you want to just know about their numbers and expectations of their player base and and what the interest is because there's a lot of doubt a lot of people saying that no one's going to be interested in classic well um right 
Uh, yeah. Do you remember this? Like there was just yeah, mm-hmm. there was there was a lot of doubt. Yeah, we could. Yeah, yeah. And and you've and you have a split between you have two audiences in WoW, and I remember talking about this at Blizzard too. We have yes. two audiences in WoW. We have those that grew up with vanilla WoW and went through that, and we have everybody else that came afterwards and jumped in at sort of so and so expansion, and there's a lot of them. There's a lot of them, and they are two competing views and they're worried about resources being taken away from one or the other initiative. And so you had an audience that was split between wanting to see this happen and not wanting to see it happen. And I got a lot of hate for asking for it to happen, you know? Um, and it, it was, it was, it just astounded me at the time because like, how could you be against this? But I think people don't realize that it doesn't take anything away from current wow to do this they're not they're not sucking resources out of the wow team to do this it's not going to hurt all their efforts to make you know uh current wow as epic and as awesome as they can they can do both and if you've never been on a dev team like we used to joke back in the day because they would (laughs) they would get mad at jeff frazier for being on our forums he was he was posting a lot for us what, why are you posting on the forums? You should get back to the game. It's like, no, it doesn't take away from the dev team at all. This is Jeff's job. This is what he does. And, you know, he doesn't code at the time. It's like, he doesn't code. He doesn't do any of this stuff. So, you know, it, it doesn't take away at all. And, and so I hope people out there really understand that now, that Classic WoW is no threat to New WoW. New WoW is no threat to Classic WoW. They can coexist. There's plenty of room. There's plenty of audience out there. One is not going to starve the other of either technology, resources, money, um, or or player base. I think that we're talking about two separate player bases, or a player base that that straddles the two and would keep both running at the same time. Yeah, I was I was going to ask. Do you think if Classic WoW was very successful, that could actually make retail WoW more successful, uh, modern WoW more successful? There's a bunch of yes. crossover. Absolutely. Every time we would release a new game at Blizzard any publisher releases a new game you get the knock-on effect to their back catalog it okay. lifts all yeah. both really? any successful okay. title shipping from a publisher boosts sales of all their other titles that's yeah. awesome so, that's awesome yeah so if if classic wow uh, turns out to be popular it will boost sales of new wow and you know it will boost sales of all blizzard games and um there's there's literally no downside financially I can see to doing this, given that I don't think it's it, it won't cost the original budget of WoW to make. You know, it's um, it's it, it, the audience is baked in. There's tremendous demand there, and you know it's not going to siphon customers away from one product or another. It's it's, it's basically just going to grow the audience and bring a lot of people yeah. back. I firmly believe that, and it seems like. You know, Blizzard is is bought into that too, where they wouldn't do this. Blizzard's always very right. good at balancing their business decision with their game ambitions and making sure that both both needs are met. So it's funny we were talking about this. Uh, I was talking about this with some friends last night. Um, like as far as like plans for whenever Classic releases and whatnot, um, I I firmly believe that for a lot of players, you know, there's the game has two separate audiences, right? You have the Classic fans and you have the retail WoW fans. But it's kind of like a Venn diagram, and, and in the center, there's some overlap. And I'm one of those people who, uh, you know, as, as I've kind of gotten more into streaming and content creation and stuff, I, I like I, I personally am enjoying BFA right now. Uh, I'm one of those people that is, is starting to sit more in the middle of the Venn diagram, more towards Classic, of course. But if I'm doing Classic, right, I'm, I'm, I'm raiding, I'm getting my world buffs, I'm getting ready for raid. Okay, I got all my stuff set. My character's ready to raid tonight. What am I going to do now? I'm going to log off, and I'm going to go play bfa i'm gonna go play live wow and i think there's a lot of people that are going to be like that and um i don't know very i i personally i'm excited for world of warcraft as a whole as an entire game as opposed to you know vanilla versus bfa or whatever yeah mm-hmm. there's definitely yeah. a huge potential for a symbiotic relationship between the two especially if they link up the subscriptions i think that's like from a consum- consumer standpoint a fan standpoint a lot of us are curious how are they going to manage the subscriptions for both games? Is it going to be a separate sub? Yeah. Are they going to sell a box version of Classic? Or are they going to kind of let you ride uh, on both games with a single subscription? I-, I hope they don't get too greedy. We used to say at Blizzard Intern, Alan used to say this a lot. It's like, don't be too greedy. Don't, you know, when we talked about pricing for WoW Sub in China and things like this, and, you know, um, uh, deliver a lot of value to your customers for their money. I would do it under one sub. Because I, I firmly believe that it would just it would just explode subscription rates 
and get players going in, in both aspects of the game. I would not do a mm -hmm. separate subscription for Classic WoW. I, I actually I think agree. it's pretty crazy that, uh, I mean, just considering like inflation or whatever, right? The, the game's cost has not gone up at all in the 14 years. I mean, it's still fourteen ninety nine. I remember, you know, I played. I was a big, big Dark Age of Camelot player uh, back before I played WoW. That's how I got into MMOs and, and eventually into WoW. Um, I remember it was originally twelve ninety nine, and they increased the price to fourteen ninety nine around the time that WoW came out, and it was just like a huge deal, and everybody was upset about it. I think it's really cool that they've managed to keep the same price for the subscription of the game throughout all this time. I mean, Dayok increased the price after freaking two or three years, I think. Well, Blizzard puts a lot of work into efficiency and economies of scale. So that the work on, on running the game, the bandwidth costs, the server costs has never stopped. They've optimized that continuously, you know, over the 10 years plus that, that the game's been running. So I think you're seeing a lot of efficiencies there and a lot of efficiencies in how do you handle customer support for that many people. And I think that's why they've been able to, to, to not raise the price yeah, and, they're, and still they've... keep it going. Yeah, especially the customer service um, became, uh, you, you had left the company. Their customer service queues had dropped way, way, um, like a tenth of what it was a couple of years after WoW had shipped. I mean, the number of people that it would take to uh, answer all the questions and all the problems that the WoW uh, customers would have was a huge, huge win. And that's probably that was their biggest expenditure was their customer service. So, um, and they way, they were, it was way more efficient. It's gotta be so much more efficient now. Like it may, it might even be like one twentieth of what it, you know, used to be. So, right. Um, and that's a huge deal. That's a lot Plus, of money. You know, yeah. just historically bandwidth costs have dropped dramatically mm -hmm. and bandwidth was so expensive when WoW shipped and it's so cheap now in bulk that, yeah. um, that 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 was another you know big pricing concern mark do you remember the conversations on whether or not to have a mouse to control to the have player a... well to to control the player facing like uh be, to save bandwidth because the, the 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 facing of the player updating that to everybody around you i remember joe was working on Joe Rumsey, our server guy. He was trying to you know, make sure, and of course, Joe was way more efficient than the like ten times more efficient than the uh, the the, the Ver or Sony Online uh, had for for their mouse. But the facing of the character constantly ha had to be updated. And if there's like forty people around you, and if there's a rogue, they need to know whether or not they're backstabbing. So that's constantly broadcasting everybody's facing uh as they're playing the game so that was kind of like the uh the big expense for uh the mouses the you're, you're jogging my memory i i actually forgot all about that yeah yeah i think it it was bandwidth optimization was always such a we yeah. were trying to run on modems at the time because yeah. we were worried not enough people had broadband yeah so we really tried to make this work on dial-up as far as the mouse goes what did stick into my head more than that was the fact that Korea told us that the game had to be fully controllable with mouse only and we needed click to move. And the rationale was that in Korea at the time, most gameplay was in uh, game rooms mm -hmm. and you had people in there that were smoking is very big in Korea. So you had people that were chain smoking. So we needed the smoking interface. You needed this hand free to take drags off your cigarette while and, right. and be able to play everything with the mouse. And so, <laughs> um, so, you know, I think we, you know, we did implement click to move, didn't we? Like, I think that that was like, a absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. No, they, yeah. they mentioned um, it and you said, Oh, if Korea wants click to move, we'll give them click to move because it, it even saves on bandwidth as well. Um, yeah. it's far cheaper, uh, in bandwidth because that's the facing isn't constantly changing as you're moving toward a area. So you, you hear this all the time with the Classic WoW discussion. I've seen it in the chat a couple of times. There are people that say people are only interested in Classic WoW because of nostalgia. What would you, what's your, what's, what would be your response to that? <laughs> I can't remember. <laughs> I mean, it's hard to be, I mean, I don't know. I, I, 
the game has changed incrementally just a little bit a little bit a little bit a little mm-hmm. bit i can't remember honestly what it was like i'm sure the forums weren't all glowing with happy rave reviews you know uh you know in vanilla wow uh, uh, but um i just i don't know uh I, I played through Wrath of the Witch King, you know. Mm-hmm. It, it seemed like a one big blur. <laughs> right. Yeah, okay. so I can't actually say, oh, you know, this. I, it was only a few, a couple expansions, okay? People who have played way more expansions have a lot more perspective because there's a lot also, you know, more turnover on the team as well. So maybe I can I, shed some light just talking in my talks with the, the Nostalrius team and some of their customer base and on um, you know what was it after that elysium or whatever there were a lot of people that i talked to that and this is anecdotal i don't have i don't have data or anything but there were a lot of people it seemed that had, were current wow players and were looking for something a little different and tried and uh, you know one of these um uh, vanilla servers and really fell in love with the way the game was like they'd never seen this before, and I had several anecdotal stories of this. And the Nostalgia team was telling me that, yeah, there's there's a bunch of players here who who never played Classic WoW. So I don't know how many there are, what percentage there are, but I I think it's simplistic to say that this is purely nostalgia, and people have rose-colored glasses on, and it's only the people who played the original WoW that will even go try this thing. I, mm-hmm. I've seen enough people say. Oh, so that's what WoW was like before. Who had never tried it before yeah. going on a vanilla server? That I think that there is some percentage out there, and not a trivial percentage, that would enjoy it just the way it, it was back then. Absolutely, I, I definitely agree. I think vanilla WoW delivers on a gameplay experience that is really absent from the current game market, especially the the current MMO market. It's very right. very unique. Yeah. Just on the curiosity, man, like. <sighs> they released star wars 30 years later you know and my <laughs> friend he went to you know he's my age he goes to the movie theater and he he goes during the day and the the theater is filled with 16 year old boys screaming and yelling and, and you know this isn't the movie they grow up on okay right but when the lights came down silence this was star wars and and it, there was just a reverence they had, this was a, a movie to not be missed. And so I think there's a lot of people that are were too young to play uh, right. World of Warcraft at that. And so this might be, you know, a lot bigger audience. I mean, we, we, I'm the Atari generation, okay? You know, <laughs> computer games is it? Uh, you know, that was part of the culture, the MTV culture that I grew up with. Um, I think there's, it could be, a new thing that might be the next new thing right, uh, who knows because it's a different audience you know mm-hmm. yeah uh, so and it, it, I, I was just gonna I say i think like uh one, one of the big things and i i think about it this way imagine you know this is, doesn't go this way for everybody but imagine you could go back in time 14 15 years and you have the knowledge that you have now and you can like replay like certain events in your life the opportunity to go back and finish i think that's what people are really looking forward to with classic is the is the chance to go back and you know i might have been 10 years old you know i'm 12 i'm, I'm just running around stranglethorn vale i'm getting ganked by a little 60 rogue and i'm level 30 and i, I don't know what's going on right mm-hmm. but the chance to go back and to finish and to go through all the raids to go do nax that's that's the big thing on almost everybody's checklist like i want to do nax so many people want to experience that who didn't get to experience that um that's kind of what I, I like to boil it down to is the opportunity to finish for so many people. Yeah. And I completely agree. And like to what John said just now, talking about like this new generation coming up, like it's funny. You don't see people doubting the appeal of a game like chess to a new generation or a movie like the Godfather or something like that. Cause these are considered timeless classics. They're always great. They appeal to so many different generations and they will always be great. And I think there's something to be said about Vanilla WoW. It is a timeless classic. If you look at the Nostalrius postmortem that was released after after Nas shut down, and you look at their actual demographics, like 35% of people, I can't remember off the top of my head, but like 35% of the people that have played it between the ages of like 16 and 21. And 
you know, going back 14 years ago, these people would have been much, much too young wow. to play vanilla, like during its its actual release. And it's just, you, you think about it, you know, John, you said it could be the next big thing. It could be the next big thing for this new generation uh, coming up. Well, you're right. I mean, think, think about all the games that came out in 2003, 2004, 2005, okay? Why is Classic WoW, Vanilla WoW, like the, the, the biggest deal out of all of them? There was something special about it. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I think you, you touched on it when you said that there, there really isn't a current MMO experience like it. MMOs are so streamlined now and so single player focused so that you can solo everything that a lot of the socialization, a lot of the community building, a lot of the difficulty too is, is gone. I mean, there is a not insignificant population out there of hardcore gamers, right? People who love a tougher challenge, um, you know, people who, who want to figure, who have, have the time and, and are interested in figuring out how a game ticks and how it works, how to optimize it, how to, how to get, get past a huge raid, that, you know, the, the, there's, the mass market really doesn't have the patience for that. Publishers really kind of have, I think, underserved this more hardcore gamer community, mm -hmm. which has never, never been tiny. It's what propelled gaming into the mass market in the first place is all these hardcore gamers that formed the right, nexus. Right, right. Absolutely. And and I think they're currently underserved. And Classic WoW could potentially hook a lot of them and ignite another fire. Because what happens when you get the hardcore fired up is they bring in all their casual friends. All right. So and, I have been... Oh, sorry, go ahead. I didn't mean to cut you off. Oh, no. Uh, well, we used to talk about this at, at Blizzard a lot. It's like you, you want the hardcore and you want the mass audience. You have to have the hardcore because they're, there's what, they, they're, they're the ones that bring everybody in. Um, right. They're the ones that, you know, they're... You, if you're not a hardcore gamer, you ask your hardcore gamer friend, what game should I be playing now? And what game can I play with you? Because you're really good. And I want to I <laughs> game with someone really good, right? So, yeah, I, I think AAA publishers underserve the hardcore market. That's where a lot of, like, indie games and, and even Japanese games have excelled at in terms of, you know, uh, retaining difficulty levels, retaining challenge, and retaining uh, a little bit of that, you know... Um, Like getting the, you know, getting the right gear and looking at someone instead of gear, going, "Where did you get that?" Right? Yeah. Versus everything being a transmog or, you know. Oh yeah. It makes it much um, more special whenever you can see, yeah. like, I can establish like a difficulty or, uh, you you had to go through a certain task in order to get what you're wearing right now. Yeah, I mean, I I feel like being cool looking and powerful has so much more meaning and value to you when you spend ninety plus percent of your time looking like an idiot, right? <laughs> yeah, and exactly. that's the way it is in Vanilla Wow. You have to have some rainy days to value the sunny days. <laughs> exactly. So and, uh, well, and and just real quick, going to what Mark said about the whole, uh, you know, the, the the hardcore gamers being underserved. Um, I'm actually going to quote uh, Asmund Gold real quick. He said this a while back. Like, there's this kind of again misguided notion in the industry that you know, the hardcore gamers, they're, they're gone. They're gone because, you know, people have so much less time now and people have gotten so busy and there's so many different sources of entertainment. But the hardcore gamers, the neckbeards, we're not gone, you know. We're just waiting. We're waiting for the right opportunity, the right game and stuff like that um, for, for some developer to finally have the cojones to, to put something out there that appeals to that hardcore neckbeardy sense. And, uh, you know, it's great to see Blizzard being the, being the one to come back to do it after I, all these years. I really think, I, and, I, and I've been saying this since the classic announcement, I, I really think that we could be on the cusp of like a renaissance in the gaming industry where if, if classic does well, if classic is successful, I think a lot of people are going to go back and look at these old games and be like, wait, wait, why, why did that work? Why, how come putting a battle royale in my game is not working right now? Like, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, not every game needs to be battle royale. I think it's going to give people kind of to, a chance to step, take a step back and say, look at this. This was good. People enjoy this. Why? And I'm, I'm excited for it. I think it's going to be great. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Classic WoW, Classic WoW's success, I mean, assuming hopefully it is successful, could definitely influence future Blizzard games, maybe, and then also non-Blizzard games as well. Yeah. It's going to be successful. It's also going to be highly controversial. I'll guarantee those two things. It'll be very successful. This is my prediction. It's going to be hugely successful. It's going to boost WoW subscribership across the board, and a lot of people are going to be unhappy with it, no matter what you do. <laughs> no matter what you do. <laughs> A lot of people, a, a not insignificant and very loud 
group of people are going to be unhappy with whatever the result is, and you're going to have a little polarization. But it will be very <laughs> successful, and it will it will boost all of WoW sales, not just Classic. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, pretty soon here, guys. Uh, I wanna I wanna start looking at some of the tweets, and uh, we, we've got a few lined up here. I wanna go into Q and A here pretty soon. Uh, stay safe and tips. Do you guys have anything else you guys wanna add before we do this? I was just gonna say. I mean, we we talked about this earlier. I'm you know I'm not a Blizzard market analyst, but I definitely think that if they have a shared subscription model, there will be days. As I'm I'm gonna be when Classic comes out, I'm all in on Classic. But there will be days. You know, maybe I just finished ranking or I'm I'm raid logging. Hey, I'm kind of bored with classic. I'm gonna go over and try retail WoW or give it a give it a, a shot for the first couple time and for the first time in a couple months because I'm I, I need a break from classic. And I think there will be crossover both ways. I think creating that healthy WoW ecosystem, both retail and classic, I think is a really positive thing. Yeah. They might they might even put you know cross game achievements, cross game rewards. Who knows? Like there could be benefits to playing both. Maybe they'll try to leverage that. Yeah. Um, the only thing I want to say, S-Fan, honestly, is, is just thank you to John and Mark for uh, for coming on. And, yeah, and real, Absolutely. And, and uh, guys, if you have not checked out the WoW Diary, it's only got like 67-ish hours, I think, left. 65 hours maybe left on its Kickstarter campaign. Um, I'm spamming in the chat right now. We got, to, we got to read a significant portion of it. And if you like vanilla, if you're excited for classic, if you just love World of Warcraft in general or game design, I promise you, you don't want to miss it. It's really, really good. It's very frank. That's what I like about it. It's very like frank and to the point. And uh, John doesn't shy away from from spitting the truth. So, uh, and of course, Mark, thank you so much for coming on. Um, can I can I add something to John's book? Like, uh, I just wanted to say that, that the whole time I've known John, he is one of the most meticulous devs I know, with a penchant, maybe even a fetish for detail and getting things right. <laughs> And um, and on no other team that I know of did someone keep a diary of what went down that day or that week with the exact words that were spoken. It's 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 almost awesome. as good as having a tape recorder that ran through the whole goddamn development. I mean, you know, it, there there's so many moments in there that I don't even remember. And and and. To have that preserved that way, and this is not someone's recollection, okay? I mean, yes, there are recollected parts. This is this is what actually happened on that day, on yeah. that week, on that month, as it happened. It's like a blow-by-blow -blow account. You cannot get that anywhere. If you're interested in game development, if you're interested in game history, if you're interested in WoW at all, this is not this is this is not an option you have to have this book and not only that he has put so much time into things like the paper quality of this book the pa you know and, and this is only something that you can get i think john this is only something available in kickstarter right the that, that oh yeah the quality version yeah the kickstarter's got a, a number of bells and whistles that frankly you don't even see in other books there's uh I could go over the, the nerdy stuff, pot, you know, spot varnishing. And, uh, but if, if John is in my office talking to me about one pixel being off on screen, you can yeah. count on this book. You can count on this book just being so wonderfully put together. It's yeah. going to it's going to seem like an Apple product. It's going to seem like, you know, it's obsessive compulsive. John, John really gets into this detail. And and like I said, you cannot find this anywhere else. And if you're interested in game dev at all, there is no other resource like this. It does not exist anywhere else. And you, and and if you want the best copy of this book, if you want the highest quality, if you want everything that John wanted this book to be, this is your last chance to get it. You've got three days left. And, yeah. Um, you know, and of course it'll be available after that. But I just wanted to stress that uh, I'm so excited for this book. And yeah. as, as soon as I heard about it, I was like, John, you got to you got to do this. <laughs> you got to make this I, happen. I, 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 and, and, you know, back at you, Mark, I what my first Kickstarter was so ridiculously bad. I made so many mistakes. I was so naive going into it that I did walk away. I had three I had less than 300 backers after eight days okay so i think i've passed six thousand backers um maybe i don't even know what it is yeah it's a yeah i'm over six thousand backers i did walk away you know oh there were tears you know i was <laughs> i was just absolutely miserable uh i was walking away from it i had the impression that 
this is a niche book people really weren't into a fad of you know a bygone you know i i don't play computer games and i so i don't you know, anymore okay because of my hands mm -hmm. uh i so i'm not in the culture any you know as much so i i just i had the strong impression that nobody cared about uh the, the the meticulous ins and out the details of game development so i was ready to move on when mark uh he came and said hey john you know how are you doing i i saw your campaign what happened and he pulled me out of the muck and he said okay i've i've done all kinds of advertising i've done all kinds of promotion this is the way you want to do it and he he educated we we spoke for hours and he, and you know, the next day we spoke for hours again and, you know, Mark doesn't have any dog in this fight other than just he, he was really impressed that I had gone through with uh, printing this book. So my promise to you is if you read this book, there are gobs and gobs of really, really embarrassing stories about Mark Kern. So if you really, <laughs> I got stuff that he's forgot about, they're all in there. Okay. And it's, this is the only source. Mark won't even remember. So there's some crazy stuff in there. I probably drank most of those memories away. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Vanilla, wow, vanilla, vanilla wow, was that hard on you, yeah? <laughs> it was hard on all of us. It was probably oh. <laughs> one of the longest, most intense crunches Blizzard had gone through. And, um, yeah, it was, it was very tough and very emotional um, throughout. So, I mean, the, the stakes were so high. Um, and yeah, so this is, um, this is something that transformed an entire company. It, it, it Blizzard had always been viewed as a sort of like a, a high end brand, a, a Gucci of game development that, you know, maybe didn't have that mass appeal, but everything they shipped was a gem and high quality and everything else. And this changed the whole company. This, the, the trajectory of the company went from here to, to just straight up vertical and, this was the definitive moment. This is what changed it. And this book is the only insight into that that you can find anywhere. And yes, there's stuff in there that I'm embarrassed about. And yes, I was a different person then than I am now. And I really don't want to read the book cover to cover because I don't want to relive everything that went down. But you should. You should absolutely yeah. see what it was like and and come on my Twitter and, 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 and tease me about it and and I'll respond. I'm very responsive on Twitter. I reply to everybody. So, um, but yeah, I mean, I think people get the, sometimes get the wrong impression of this book. Like, you know, there's a lot of reading or everything. I was like, no, you're, you're right. It's a coffee table book, but it's also packed with anecdotes and facts and, and nothing is made up. You know, this is, this is blizzard approved. Nothing is made up. It's all as it happened. Um, the time that it happened and it's accurate. There's nothing, nothing like it anywhere else. I, I just, I was so fascinated with the book. And, and John's right. I, I don't have, and I don't have any, 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 any stake in this. I just want to see this book do well. I want people to know what it took to make WoW because it was such an important part of our lives, mm -hmm. and consumed so much of our energy. I, I want people to see, see what everybody went through, see what it took to do this. Yeah, and yeah. And, and I started with like I wanted it to be a textbook. I wanted to go into teaching, you know, like I, 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 that's what I would love to see this most because, you know, when you go to Blizzard, 80% of the company is from Southern California and I'm from Akron, Ohio. And I know through my life, I've been surrounded by super smart, intelligent, creative people. And I know they're, they're those type of people in Wisconsin and Florida and Alaska and Maine and not just southern california and if this book could do anything i would love to bridge the gap between the developer in the traditional game development areas where our entertainment industry is focused on the west coast and a little in texas and a little in new york you know but it i think that i just think there's a lot of uh, a lot of people can get a lot out of this book there's a lot of honesty in it so for yeah. sure um, I, I want to go ahead and uh, start on the first question. And we've talked about this before, um, but I, I do think this is a good starter question, especially with you guys on here. Uh, the question is, and this is on Twitter, do you think Blizzard will could possibly launch uh, Burning Crusade after Classic WoW vanilla, basically? 
like I, I, for me personally, I would say that it, it all depends on the success of the game. If the game's successful, if, if they're making money off of it, then uh, that's something for me personally I would be very, very excited for is to get a chance to go back to Burning Crusade. Blizzard's very smart about money and making money. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, like I said, we've always blended the business sense with, with the game sense. There's a lot of studios that maybe are too pie in the sky, you know, and they get creative visions and they run into trouble later pursuing those. There's some that are way too business focused and they forget what the gamers really like. Um, you still have Mike there. Mike's still running the show. He has that view, that balance. And I know that a lot of people say Blizzard's not the way it used to be. And yes, it has changed in many ways. But the person who cares about it is, is going to look at a way to, to be to be true to both. Mike Mike is a gamer. You know, uh, people probably don't know that. And uh, Mike is also an extremely shrewd businessman. And I think he's going to find a way to blend the two. If this product is successful, yes, they will find more ways to make money from it. That's what they do. But not in any sort of cynical way. Um, as much as people think that that's, you know, maybe the case in a couple of things they've done, I really think, what, when, especially when it comes to WoW, you're going to see just... Uh, you know, like John said, that that sort of reverence, that sort of like, it has to be good. And if we're going to make money for it, it's not just going to be for money's sake that we, we have to deliver something special here. Well, definitely. I think if the company whose product you love and enjoy is being successful in making money, that's a very good thing for you as the consumer, the person consuming the product that you enjoy and love. Right. Yeah. So great. I, I'm, I'm hoping fingers crossed for a classic TBC as well and more. Yeah. Uh, real quick, I, I see this a lot. A lot of people come into the chat and say, what have I missed so far? Uh, guys, if, uh, if you did miss the early part of the podcast, what you can do is uh, you can go to my YouTube channel, uh, SFAN TV. I post all the, the podcasts there the next day or within the next couple of days. Um, so you guys can go there. You guys can sub there, and I'll post there. Uh, of course, Tips Out Baby and Stay Safe TV on YouTube as well if you guys would like to go sub to them. Uh, classic content. If you're interested in WoW Classic, if you're interested in Vanilla WoW, uh, the place to be for sure. Uh, yeah. the next question, and we talked actually, we, John, John and I talked about this a little bit, uh, off stream. This is from big Papa Grizz. Uh, when it came to PVP being put into the game, what was the biggest concern outside of a technical standpoint of how will this work and how does this counter that to create a great experience in vanilla? Wow. John, if you want to start, um, I'm sorry. I uh, could you say that again? I, I... <laughs> Sorry. Uh, when it came to being PvP put in the game, what was the biggest concern outside of the uh, the, the technical aspects of the game? As I remember it, um, everybody wanted to try something different or their own idea. Uh, there was never a quorum of, oh, let's do it this way. Like, for, for raids, we... You know, the EverQuest guys, they knew what to do. They were all moving in the same direction. That's how Molencore got made in a, in, in a week, you know? <laughs> I mean, it, it, was, it, it, was, it was crazy. But uh, for PvP, uh, well, I had my idea. I mean, everybody had their own ideas. Uh, that, 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 I think. And the problem was with, with no programmers available, you really couldn't test anything so mm. uh yeah we tried to test early and when things weren't working it was just i whole i wrote a whole article about after we shipped wow us trying to test pvp it was just uh it was so <laughs> it, was, it was you would never think that this is blizzard the amount of <laughs> uh, yeah the, the amount of failure at so many levels i mean when we, we don't have the tools to set everybody up on a high level character so that everybody, they didn't recognize the spells like the testers. These are the devs who are testing it. It would take weeks and weeks of servers down. You know, the test was canceled. OK, get up, the, get the new build the next day. OK, you wait for one o'clock. The test is at one o'clock. Nobody, everybody's walking around the hallways to find out what happened. Not there's something wrong with the build. It was weeks of that. So much <laughs> to the point, people stopped volunteering for the tests. People start, stopped getting the build, stopped reading the emails, responding to the emails. I mean, this was, this was, this was before we got to the test, which was also a disaster. Like people were just like, you know, you know, like, oh, this is terrible. This is not fun. So it was, 
but that's all the technical stuff. Uh, I guess you said. Not well, you, you, well <laughs> you, also, you also mentioned uh, before we went, went before we went live with Classic Cast as we were kind of hanging out uh, before. You had said that you were afraid of people griefing. There would be too much. Griefing. Oh yeah. Oh well, that was years. Okay. So all right. Um, yesterday I had an AMA with uh, Kevin Jordan, and he had told me something I didn't even realize. It's not in my book that he had sent Alan a super long email, this manifesto on how there should be a horde alliance split. And that's, he brought up, he was talking about this, that uh, <laughs> he says, John, this thing was crazy that I was quoting fight club. You know, how do you know what you're capable of doing unless you've faced adversity? Like th these are the things that he's pulling into the super long email, uh, trying to convince Alan Abham because Blizzard equated PVP with griefing. There had been no game out there that had before Anarchy Online and Dark Age of Camelot, of course. There had been mm -hmm. no games. PvP was synonymous with griefing behavior, just <laughs> absolutely uh, game-ruining behavior. And all the designers were, except Kevin, I guess, they were absolutely opposed to that. Kevin's a griefer, by the way. Uh, all Everyone was opposed to that type of gameplay um and alan came by and this is the guy that founded the company and he said kevin i want you to know i agree with every single thing you wrote in that email and <laughs> that the change that you know and then he he has also had proof of concept at the time where um uh Anarchy Online came right. along and, and they, they control and same Dark Age of Camelot reinforced it. But that's the ball that got rolling. So, yeah, people learn as you go, as you are developing the product. There is no I think the, the one thing that I didn't realize that all these AMAs have taught me is how players uh, their concept of how we develop games is that there's a plan <laughs> a plan okay so surprise you know then you get punched in the face as mike tyson says okay everyone has a plan okay but that is not how game development you learn as you go you discover things as you go and and questions what was the plan for this what was the overall plans did you guys string things no, we were just like making assets and then we'd have a dungeon as an asset. And then the, the game designers say, okay, this room's kind of cool. We can do this little game in here. There's no planning, okay? Uh, because, and again, the, the lore would change so frequently because assets would become unavailable. Technology would become unavailable that Chris Metzen would have to change the story. So he couldn't have this uh the, the the tablets from down on the mountain saying this is what the game is going to be that that, that that was never the case uh chris was flexible when when we got assets uh made finally months later when things could be tested years later then we kind of worked with what we had uh, so that that's probably the biggest change in pvp was no uh you know exception to that that we didn't we were just learning as we go so we we're pretty surprised mm -hmm. that open world pvp servers were so popular but there's yeah. also the you know the dedicated pvp maps and we had issues with that too in terms of you know being too npc reliant in places do you mean battlegrounds or yeah like uh, who knew okay. moba was it, a thing it, it, <laughs> okay. well, if, if yeah. we knew mobas were a thing we would not have been concerned with the amount of npcs we had running around doing stuff um so maybe we missed the boat on that a little bit because we revamped <laughs> it to remove the focus of, of NPCs and and NPCs, um, you know, uh, basically doing attacks and things. But you know, um, we were shocked by the amount of um, support and and love for open world PvP in the game. Uh, although Alan was always a big PvPer in Dark Age, every time we played Dark Age, we'd mm. jump in and and he's always the one leading the charge about. Yeah, yeah. Ab about going into PvP in, the, in, in Dark Age of Camelot. So I, you know, I, I think Alan always wanted PvP, and um, I'm talking and, about and... pre Dark Age Alan Adham, because yeah. PvP oh. was PvP was not popular on EverQuest because it was all griefing. Okay, yeah. and, and it was an awful experience. That's what they imagined. 
Blizzard PvP right. was going to be right. So, uh, yeah, pre Dark Age, pre Kevin's email, absolutely. I mean, I, w- I I was from the shooter, so I didn't have any sympathy for somebody who couldn't, you know, hold their own against a one on one contest. But you know, Eric Dodds would just go, "Oh no, we yeah, we're we're probably not going to have that because <laughs> you know we don't want the we don't want to foster that type of behavior and." We just didn't realize that, yeah, you can actually have consensual PvP uh, and make it fun and actually make it fairly open world. I played on a PvP server, and even when we launched, uh, when Alan was gone and Rob uh, Rob and uh, Jeff, they were, nah, PvP is not going to be good because in their heads, they remembered our, uh, uh, EverQuest and how EverQuest had actually offered PvP and they were surprised when our few PvP servers crushed with, uh, with um. Yeah, I remember users. having to allocate more and more PvP servers and being utterly shocked at how popular it was. Yeah, yeah. And, um, but John, you, you mentioned something else really interesting about how about planning. The the problem with World of Warcraft is that we knew we had so much content to create, we had to build it before we even knew what the gameplay was. Oh, absolutely. Right. Yeah. yeah. We talked about we this did... last week. Yeah. We didn't know about the death mechanic, how it was going to work. We didn't know how big raids were going to be. We didn't know how many people would fit into a corridor, what scale things would be. <laughs> we had no idea about the gameplay, if, how much maneuverability we needed. and so. But we knew we had to build X amount of dungeons, and we knew we had to build X amount of zones. We had no choice but to build blindly in order to meet That's crazy. The, the shipping deadlines before we even know what the gameplay was going to be. And... Um, so yeah, that was that was a real roll of the dice. Yeah, I remember being on a tour of an aircraft carrier, and it was uh, it was the or it was it was a, they were describing what the new aircraft carriers are the, the the ones that are being built right now, and they have on their bridge where real estate is absolutely at a premium uh, on the bridge of these aircraft carriers. There's five thousand people on this ship, the bridge prime real estate they have an empty area on the bridge there's no consoles there's there's no machines and it's for the technology that the 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 u.s navy will need years later that they just don't even know what it is so it's that's kind of like what we were doing where like, we, if it takes so long to build a dungeon some of these dungeons took many months to do by the time you're done you realize oh you know that monster was canceled so we can't populate the dungeon with that monster anymore so we'd have to find a new monster and then that monster didn't go with the boss monster that we were going to put there so we'd have to find a new boss boss monster and you know some some bosses completely changed Karazhan used to be a giant demon named Malganus. that was that was the boss of uh Karazhan uh, right. way back in the day so yeah it's yeah. crazy i got a really good question actually that i saw from earlier we should have asked <laughs> you this last week too john okay. Okay. but before but before we do uh what does the number twelve thousand mean to you john uh i don't let's see what's twelve thousand you are twelve thousand dollars away from being the most crowdfunded book of all time. Oh it's, my goodness! Yeah. Something is happening. Oh, holy moly! We got to do this. Twelve. Yeah. Oh my goodness! Yeah. We could do twelve thousand. Come on, let's do this. God, is the world of Warcraft just, diary? You know, the it. You're gonna set a record, yeah. John. Yeah. It went up six thousand dollars in the past hour. If only Kickstarter took Twitch Prime, man, that would be crazy. <laughs> wow, <laughs> we hit it right now. Okay, okay, yeah. okay. So I have, uh, yeah. I have like a hundred and thirty uh, extra backers. So there's some people listening to this who aren't buying the book. What's wrong with you guys? <laughs> oh my God. We know how many people are. No, I'm... <laughs> no, no, he's, yeah, he's joking. No, 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 no. Um... Come on, come on. <laughs> so whenever uh, here's here's another question from Fishy Lawn Gnome um were you There's guys a question, though, real quick the really really good one we're gonna forget it if we don't ask it now okay okay the oh, south yeah. park episode what did the, what did you guys think about the south park episode i don't remember it ever being to, like that was something i think mauricio was doing like our animators were just gone like they were 
crunching on that for a long time. Uh, when it was, I'm sure we got a preview of it internally, but unfortunately, yeah, we didn't know it was a thing while it was being developed. And this is again, Blizzard playing its cards very close to their chest because mm. if, 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 you know, Matt Stone didn't like the episode and it got canceled, it didn't want to, to get everybody's hopes, you know, super high until they absolutely knew, okay, here's the finished polish. Here's the polished product, you know, uh, but I don't have any memory other than seeing it like maybe a day before it was on the air. So I didn't know of anything going on. Um, did yeah. you like it? Uh, I, I did like it. Uh, I love recognizing <laughs> Joey Ray as he's the guy, or the guy who sat, you know, like this, the, <laughs> the, the guy who has no life. That was modeled after Joey Ray, and he's on Joey my. Joey Ray put a lot of work into that episode he, too. Yeah, he's 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 our. Uh, uh, oh geez, I don't even know. Uh, he's my cousin. Okay, how? Oh, yeah. that, no, it was a running joke. We look nothing alike. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so the running joke was that Joey Ray was my cousin, and and we we would voice this off on unsuspecting team members and try to convince them that we were really cousins. <laughs> But that's Joey just... Ray is so so rude and so frank that he's an acquired taste. Oh, yeah. I thought he was picking on me when I first started at Blizzard. I, he would come into my office and just say shit, and I was like, "Who is this guy? And what is he saying to me?" <laughs> yeah. and, and then I, I I confronted him one day, and he he suddenly got this puppy dog look. He was like, "Oh my gosh, have you been reading me wrong this whole time? <laughs> I really like you. I, yeah. I, I just I, I did." I never meant to hurt your feelings. I was just talking shit, you know. And mm -hmm. so it, it, that was really surprising. And that's when we, we, you know, we realized we both had relatives uh, from back in o Ohio and stuff. And we forged this myth that we were cousins, and we tried to perpetuate it. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, but that, that episode floored me because I'd already left the company at the time, and um, people said it was coming out. And at my new company, we all gathered around on the TV to watch it. And after the episode. Because most of the people on our team had not worked on World of Warcraft at the new company, all the heads turned to me, and um, and were like, "What just happened? How do you feel?" You know, just like you guys are asking now, and it was really numb. It was like I can't believe it's reached some sort of cultural relevance here. Right. Yeah. And the, the significance true. was not lost on me. That's it was, true. Right. It was stunning. Absolutely flooring me i had i was speechless yeah and it was so funny and i laughed so hard <laughs> to the whole thing that's really and... the first pop culture you know real reference to so. world of warcraft uh yeah. i i completely forgot yeah that you're right it was a realization it's it's so yeah. funny so oh, i didn't mean to cut you off you want to go ahead it, just reinforcing john's point it, it was uh some sort of some sort of wall fell some sort of not just in, for WoW, but for all of gaming. Something, something broke that day, uh, and, and just and just spilled out into into mm -hmm. into the zeitgeist of consciousness. You know, that that I never thought was was possible before. Right. Yeah, I was gonna say. So I, I was I was really well known for for being a WoW player. I, I played football in high school and all this, and I also played WoW. I was I was a good WoW player. So. Whenever everybody finally saw this game that I was always talking about, I'm like, guys, you got to try out this game. This game's awesome, whatever. And then they see it on South Park because everybody watched South Park in high school. Um, they were like, dude, what is wrong with you? <laughs> I was like, no, dude, it's amazing. <laughs> like, and I remember I, I, I love that episode so much, but it's like I just told him, I was like, yeah, dude, I'm the guy. I'm the guy with the chip on my stomach and I'm playing the game like this. I was like, <laughs> it is what it is, dude. <laughs> and Joey Ray actually has that picture. That's his Facebook that's so uh, awesome that's that's what he is on facebook so it's so great yeah. uh this kind of leads into actually uh into fishy's question but he was talking about how um how eye-opening was it for you guys whenever you saw the support for like blizzard sanctioned legacy servers right i mean you you, you obviously delivered the petition to to mike morheim uh mark but were you guys surprised when you're like wow there's a lot of people that really still want to play vanilla wow from 14 years ago um yeah i thought 
I thought it would be the number of our the the signed petition would be a lot lower than it was. I, I forget how many signatures we reached. Was it over three hundred thousand? It was like two hundred and ninety, I think. Two hundred and ninety. Yeah. And um, I knew I knew I wanted to really give it weight, and I and I took an old Blizzard trick. Okay, I said I when I deliver this petition to Blizzard. I want, you know, and, and this comes from when we ship box games. When Blizzard shipped box games, we would always include a notepad, a, a, you know, just a blank notepad with the Blizzard logo on it. You could take notes for your game or whatever, and we would put that in every box. And why we did that was the whole concept of perceived value. Back in the day, you would go to a game store, you would pick up the box, you would turn it around, you would heft it in your hand, and we wanted that thing to feel heavy. We wanted it to feel heavier than any other game in that store. So for your 60 bucks, you felt like you were getting something twice as much as the other game because it weighed twice as much. And so, <laughs> and it worked. I mean, this, this, this type, these types of, I mean, you know, Apple's very good at talking, you know, Steve Jobs used to talk about the, how objects communicate to you. Like how does an object communicate to you that it's valuable, that it's, that it's special? And he would obsess over every industrial design feature of a, of a phone to make you feel like you had high perceived value. Blizzard was the same way with his boxes. And so when I delivered the petition to Mike, I said, it has to be printed out. Mike has to see how heavy this is. He's got to lift a box to feel these signatures and not just get an email with them. And people were giving me so much crap about killing trees and doing this. And it's like, no, they saved all those boxes. And I knew we were onto something then when they kept those boxes and they didn't toss them out. Like Mike specifically ordered those boxes to be preserved. And, um, and so, you know, that's um, when I had, when I actually printed all that out and I saw how many pages there were packed with signatures, I was like, this, this is demand. This, there really is something here. And so I really wanted to convince Mike of that. And that's why I printed all, all the signatures out. And I insisted on doing that. And it was actually a WoW fan who ran a, his, his mother ran a local printing shop who oh, you you know, kind of cut us a deal on getting that turned around real fast and, and efficiently and, and for us to be able to do that. So um, that, was, that was great. And yeah, and I, and I did use Mike's own dirty trick on him. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's also something to put in the Blizzard Museum as well. Yeah. I mean, Blizzard well, has. Do you think he still has them? I think so. Oh yeah, I think <laughs> if if they're moving forward with the project, that is definitely something you would want to see in the Blizzard Museum. I mean, that's 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 evidence. That I mean, that's hard evidence of the passion of the fans, you know, behind uh, one of their products, which is basically what their museum's about. It's got the 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 StarCraft CD that's been up in the space shuttle, and it's got the <laughs> the sneakers, the the StarCraft sneakers from uh, Korea. It just like all the permeation of. Do, do people know about that, John? The StarCraft CD that I, I was to just orbit? about to ask. Yeah, oh, what is that? yeah. Well, they Blizzard. Okay, so Blizzard. Oh, you're cutting out. You're cutting out. Let's not lose the story. <laughs> Let's see. A little bit of lag here. Uh, okay, uh, there we're good. No, no, we're good. Uh, <laughs> okay, no. we're good. Uh, we're good. Uh, there's, a, there's a museum, the Blizzard Museum. Apparently, I actually don't know. I'm sure. Here, I'm, I'm Googling right now while we're talking, so I know right. what I'm talking I, about. I know, I know, Mark, I know you probably story. know. <laughs> but um, there was uh, a NASA astronaut that was a big StarCraft fan. And astronauts are allowed to bring a certain weight and size of personal effects with them into orbit um, when they launch on these shuttle missions. And this astronaut had carried this CD of StarCraft into orbit, and um, and it had circled the Earth X number of times and traveled at this rate of speed, and he didn't know who to give it to. So he called up Blizzard customer support. And, okay, can you imagine being in Blizzard? Here you are. You're a tech, you're, you're a tech support rep. And you get a call, and the guy goes, I'm an astronaut, and I just a StarCraft package. What's your address? And you're not going to buy this, right? So basically, the guy hung up on him. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't know mind. this story. Okay. I didn't know this story. Yeah, and was this Mark Downey who took the call? So, and... um. I think it was one of the guys that ends up being a level designer on the WoW team. I wish I could remember, but he was telling Maybe me Josh sounds like a Josh. No, it wasn't. <laughs> it, um, but, but the guy called back. The astronaut called back, and he reached someone in tech support who was willing to believe him. Said, "No, I really think this is real." 
And so he, he was willing to put in the time to talk through it, to verify everything and give him the address. And sure enough, I remember when this thing arrived, it was framed. It had the NASA mission badges because every NASA mission has a unique badge. Wow. So it had the mission badge from this it. This blows it my mind. Exactly how yeah. many times it orbited the Earth, at what speed, at what altitude and everything else. It was just the coolest thing. And it sat gathering dust for a long time because we didn't have a museum in fact we had no archival at all i was one of the first people and i think this is why i was so passionate about classic wow i was one of the first people that that hired a, an archivist at blizzard I, I went out and i tried to find someone who i said it's got to be a background in library library sciences and preservation of stuff and uh and and i made the first archivist hire and um, all that stuff would just get shoved in her office along with uh, data preservation. So all the build servers for StarCraft because the, the, the game would not build except on this one PC that was in Mike's office. And so we had to <laughs> ensconce that PC and deliver the whole PC into her office in order to preserve it so that we could <laughs> build StarCraft because there's no other way it would work. And, um, and so, yeah, so there, there really is a CD of StarCraft that has orbited the Earth. That's amazing. That Incredible. blows my mind. That's so freaking and cool. Yeah. And I'm glad that it's in there, um, in the in the museum now, and they've got a place to display it. And I think John's right. I think I think that petition did get saved. Mike did specifically say he was going to save it. It's history. I, I mean, that's got to be his. I mean, if they come out with this, uh, this server, I mean, my gosh, that that's the inception right there. Yeah. You you rarely because we're you're in we're in digital. Okay, you rarely have something tangible that actually goes into a game you know it's it's always a digital file you know at best it's a digital file uh worst it's a right. it's a movie that just doesn't you have to have a screen and stuff like that to show it yeah yeah the, the physical aspect so important i remember on wow they only wanted to deliver me bug reports digitally right. and i i insisted on printouts because i wanted to feel the gravity of the situation, how many bugs we're up against. And I, and I felt like team leads need to feel this too, that you can't just clap eyes on it because you're like, oh, there's 6,000 bugs. I, I see a counter on a website, big deal. But you get 6,000 bugs delivered on your desk in paper and a bunch of them are <laughs> highlighted with your name on it. You're gonna, you, you take that more seriously. There's a real psychology to this uh. that I think a lot of people miss in a pure digital space. Uh, about how much the tangibility of something can affect your your, your yeah. perception of it. I think yeah. you're really right, and that's why going back to the South Park episode when he holds up the Sword of a Thousand Truths on the thumb drive, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. it's like the exact opposite of that. It's not yeah, it's so all. good. It's so good. Yeah, and who knows? Maybe they got the idea of burning the tree for BFA from uh, all those uh, petition signatures as well. So. Yeah. <laughs> that was one thing Metzen didn't get. He wanted an actual tree, and we didn't have the tech to do it at the time, so we kind of got this mushroom thing instead so that's why the shape of the tree changed <laughs> there you go there you go that's awesome uh pretty soon guys i want to go from uh twitter questions to chat questions this one's more of a fun one uh this one comes from uh, matt the Kiefer. uh do you guys have any favorite wow memes um uh, and uh, you know this is for everybody right uh any favorite wow memes like man crook's wife uh any stories around big game events or bugs like the aq opening the hakar corrupted blood incident or uh, shrunk orc shoulder pads. I had forgotten about the small orc shoulder pads actually until I just read that. I remember that was a thing forever, but uh, but yeah, like any 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 sort of like funny certain things that, that jokes that came out of the game, any memes that came out of the game that you guys really enjoyed. For me, it was all the player content. Mm -hmm. The it w it wasn't what we the Easter eggs we put into the game. It was really uh, more dots. I love, you know, oh, yeah, uh, I love Leroy Jenkins. Uh, yeah. You know, yeah. it was all the user-created stuff because we would pass those around the office and gather around. Oh, absolutely! Yeah. Illegal and Danish. Uh, uh, was, their 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 movies were just fantastic, and we'd get these things. Uh, I mean, <laughs> oh, what was the uh, uh, all the single ladies? The 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 song of about every every. Oh, geez. Every item's for the hunters. Um, everything's a hunter weapon. All, oh, God, God, what By was Nim? It? Was that Nim? I can't, I remember. can't remember. Oh, my gosh. The Oxhorn, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, any anytime some of a video was done using WoW, yeah, it usually got circulated through the team. Yeah. That's awesome. That's so yeah. cool. That, it, that it, meant more to us than, than any 
meme that the game directly inspired. You know, I think it, what what I remember the most is just being so incredulous that people would put their time into into creating something around our game or or just the moments that it created the the, the user content around it, the right. user stories. It's very endearing. Yeah, and and yeah. I find myself when I whenever I would uh leave the bubble the blizzard bubble and i'd leave and i'd talk to my cousins or something like that and i'd meet their friends they it would come across uh, like my cousins oh he john worked on wow and or he, he would say john worked on computer games my cousin was he he uh he he only played console games so he didn't know computer games very well and i would explain it it's a it's an mmo called world of warcraft and this is after wow had shipped you know everyone had heard of world of warcraft so to them i didn't want to be presumptuous in assuming oh everyone's heard of you know the game that i have worked on <laughs> you know <laughs> but i ended up pat, uh, pat patronizing and like talking down like as if they hadn't heard of world of warcraft <clears throat> so they, a, a lot of people had to stop me like yeah 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 i've heard of it i've heard of it okay <laughs> but i mean it's like you you you're in a bubble and you don't realize like that south park that was i i had forgotten yeah that was like a moment that wow people have really heard of what this what we were working on i mean it's when everything's on the forums when everything's on email or youtube you really don't realize that it penetrates to uh late night talk shows jimmy fallon talking about world mm -hmm. of warcraft you know it's uh, you, you you forget that it's that big, so especially My, if you're deaf. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of weird. I mean, I've got kids. I don't know how many of you are are parents, but um, you know, I I talk to my kids about WoW and Diablo and games I've worked on, and it never really sinks in. But then you know, I remember in a, in a more social setting, they're they're meeting other people who either recognize me or have played the game and love it, and they start talking to them about Diablo or WoW and geeking out and and asking them questions about the game that they never ask me <laughs> just, and the, it's like it's like okay you've got you've got someone who was on the project living with you and yet you're more interested in talking to this other guy about their experiences in the game and i think that that's um um that that keeps you in check and also um it's just indicative that i think again the the stories that the gamers share around the games we made or what or what's really special you know i think that yeah. that those moments are are what i that 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 geek us out the most we love hearing about people getting married in the game or you know or events that happened organically that we never planned for um, is it true is it true that tom chilton met his wife in wow is that true oh that i don't know john i don't know that either I don't. That was after my t my time there. Yeah, that was that would have been. Yeah, it would have been. I don't know. A lot of people did though. A lot of people did, and a lot of people messaged me about how the game literally saved their lives. Oh. Yeah. And huh. you know, going through tough moments and things, and 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 I I never thought about it before until all these stories started pouring in, about um you know people would message me on Twitter or anything and and say yeah i was i was going through a tough time in high school or i was suffering from some disease and this was the only thing that kept me going and to realize that a game a game might have saved lives on a huge scale more than maybe most doctors get to save i mean collectively when you talk about the game just the, and, just the sheer volume of people playing yeah, yeah. The population is greater than that of of many major cities, you know, and and to think that 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 the game didn't just entertain, but maybe saved lives is is it, I had never thought of that before, and it's extremely humbling, and um, and it, it made me feel that it was all worth it, all the pain and suffering went through, all the arguments, all the you know everything we did to to you know I used to I I don't know if you've got me quoted in the book John is saying oh well. It, this is like a plane. We're going to land it. It may it may be missing an engine and a landing gear and being on fire, but this but this game will ship. <laughs> yeah. I personally, I, was I pers say, oh sorry, go ahead, John. I was just on what Mark was saying. I personally don't want to take credit for those people, you know, looking for you know 
that saving their lives or something because I don't want to take the blame for all the people that flunked out of college playing our game. <laughs> okay, so, you, you can't take just one and not the other. So I'm just, I don't want to be responsible for all those flunk outs because I've heard a lot more flunk out stories than, than I anything. I never know else. whether I should apologize for a while. Or, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, one of the most heartwarming stories I've, I've ever heard is the kid, I think his name was Ezra, uh, and it was Make-A-Wish Foundation. He got the world right. first Phoenix Burning Crusade. I always thought that was so awesome. Yes. Yeah. Really cool. And, like, you, I, I, when I knew, like, this is when I knew WoW was, like, how powerful the game was. After Classic was announced, the amount of phone calls I got in that first month from friends that I had lost touch with, that hadn't spoken to in, like, over five years more, um, there's a particular friend of mine. He's he's a big shot lawyer now up north in Silicon Valley. He does patents, uh, intellectual property patents for like Google and Facebook and all these big companies. The next day after Classic WoW was announced at BlizzCon, I get a phone call from this guy who I haven't spoken to in like six or seven years. Dude, you know, we're going to play Classic again. It's going to be amazing. It's going to be like the old days and stuff. <laughs> and it was just incredible to see how many people have brought back together, even after, you know, years of just, you know, losing touch. That was really cool. Yeah, I, dude, I had like a, I, I was a, an above average player in Burning Crusade. I was pretty decent. Uh, you know, I, I sound like that guy talking about high school football now. But uh, I actually, I had a <laughs> bunch of people I played with in game who found my stream since, and they like guys that I had added on Facebook that I hadn't talked to in years. And just like, dude, like, that's so crazy that you're into like classic WoW and all this stuff and you're streaming now and this and that. And, you know, people I literally hadn't talked to in almost 10 years uh, have, have come into my stream. I've gotten a chance to talk to them and I've gotten a chance to reconnect with people. And that's what it's all about, dude. It's, it's about like whether you make friends in game or whether it's friends that you've had in real life. And the, the community that this game fosters is so freaking amazing. And like I have like real memories, like sure it was in a game, but I have real memories with these people like real things happen to me even though it's there's it's pixels right that's that's one of the things that uh, i don't know i love it love it it's awesome I'm, I'm gonna play because i think it's been long enough and i've forgotten enough that i can actually experience it as maybe a player would there you go uh, that's awesome because yeah. when you're working on it and you're that close to it and this is a real challenge i have with you know especially with you know you know, when people ask me specifically for how this mechanism worked or that, it's like we changed it so many times or renamed something so many times. I can't remember half the stuff anymore. And that's that's going to let me, I think, experience it as if it were new. And I, I always wanted to do that. It's like I always wanted to know what does it feel like to play this game? Because when you ship it, you you you, you can't see that. You can't have that experience. But enough time has passed, enough changes have, have gone through that I don't remember the original experience anymore and i'm really looking forward to trying it and seeing it actually seeing it for the first time it's awesome. order alliance order alliance i was or... always alliance but i went horde when night uh, when uh blood elves came out so um i i do alliance I, i'd be i'd be on the alliance side good call good, good call good you're a good guy oh, you're a good guy Mark. Right. <laughs> you're a good guy did you guys know about um, how there was a Horde Alliance imbalance, especially in Korea, when we first shipped the game? Really? Uh, yeah, I, and, and... Well, that's what prompted Blizzard to make Blood Elves, right? Because they wanted their girlfriends to be able to play. Is that is that true? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, that's one, uh, that's uh, one well, of the reasons. Johnson uh, is saying no. But it... No, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so th especially in Korea, we were having a huge imbalance where most players were going Alliance over Horde. And... Um, and, it, and we would we would be combing through the game trying to figure this out. And we did find, for example, that there were more quest chains on the Alliance side and there were fewer gaps. So we thought maybe that was one reason. But the other thing that I was doing is I was taking Korean gaming magazines and I was going through all their games. I couldn't read anything. But right. I was going through every screenshot and every image and trying to figure out why we were getting this imbalance. And I realized that um, if they had like an evil side, there was always a, a, a beautific race right. on that side. Uh, beautific male, beautific female. There was always some sort of beauty ideal. And we, all we had were monstrous creatures. Right? Yeah, on the horde, so, pretty much. Yep. And so, you know, we talked to our Korean office about this, and, and, and it was their theory. I, I actually think it was their theory, and they were telling us, and I was going through all the magazines to try to confirm this. And I was like, uh, holy crap, I, I think they're right. And, you know, 
Um, I left six months after we shipped WoW to mm -hmm. start my own company, but uh, I'm glad to see that. But when when Blood Elves came back, I mean, it totally pulled you know my wife and I back in into Horde. It's like because we were we were like that. We wanted to play yeah. you know that type of idea you know that type of you know. Uh, not a monstrous race, but like yeah. a, a humanoid, you know, uh, you know beautific race mm -hmm. um, uh, to go do that. So, yeah, there was this huge imbalance and we were very, very concerned about it for a long time. Right. I think it's I think it's really cool that even though you had uh, stopped working on the game, that you you went back to the game and you were still playing. I think that's really cool. Yeah. Just uh, I mean, because I, I feel like that's something that seems kind of unexpected, right? Because like, like you you'd go and, and you'd work on another project, but like you still cared for the game. Um, that. Yeah. Yeah, I think that well at Blizzard we always said that we we knew we made a good game if after you shipped it you still wanted to play it. Right. If you were if you weren't a hundred percent sick of it by the time you shipped it then, then you had something. So uh I mean that was the case. So um but yeah, even after I left I, w I was still interested in playing it. But again, I, I couldn't have that new player experience. You know? And so uh, uh, that's why I'm really looking forward to it now because you know, maybe it'll stir up a lot, bunch of memories, but it's, um, I also know that it's going to be so fresh to me in some ways because enough time has passed that I'll get to I'll get some of that magic. Right, right. Yeah, I um. You know I, what? You should you should stream it. You really should. That would be so interesting <laughs> to watch yeah. you level up and play the game and kind of comment. Oh, this is why we did that. You know, that would be so entertaining. I'd watch. I, you know what? <laughs> I was thinking of doing a director's cut of like just. Uh, walking through one of my dungeons and just pointing out how I made things and who who helped who who built that. That would be really because, cool, you know. Mm -hmm. but, really cool. Oh, that sounds like a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, getting all the technical stuff like I'm not a filmer or anything like that. <laughs> right. but, uh, uh, so you, I, you forget how long those dungeons are too. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was typing in the chat a little bit, uh, trying to pump, prompt some uh, some questions from people in the chat. Uh, I didn't get a chance to say. I don't want to interrupt anybody. But uh, I, we are taking some questions from the chat now. Uh, kind of Again, we, we are kind of doing more of a QA and a and, and we might think of some stuff ourselves, too. Uh, but one question from uh, Novelty Engine. What was the internal reaction to the Zolgarub Plague whenever uh, that mm -hmm. that went haywire? Because were you, were, you, were you around for this, Mark? Or was this no. right after? John John was, though. Okay. I was... I was I was around for this. Um, I get asked this question a lot, and I'm really curious. <laughs> I, I was. I want to say. Let's see. I, I think Kevin and Pat were, uh, Kevin Jordan, who I was at the AMA, and Pat Nagel. We were at lunch, and Pat just casually mentioned that there's like this plague going around. Okay. And we didn't know about this as much. Like sometimes when something happens on, on the forums, you know, very few of the artists, very few of the programmers, the designers are usually onto the forums to find out what's going on. So it was just like, we didn't think it was a big deal at all. It was, it was a kind of funny anecdote. Maybe right. 15 seconds worth of conversation. Then we went on to the next thing. That was <laughs> the only thing we knew about this ridiculous event. Like I have this. Um, uh, when we launched the public beta. Okay, this was the mm -hmm. uh, the public beta that the or Mark. Do you remember? Okay, so this will Mark completely has forgotten about this. Okay, so <laughs> we had bugs we were going all right so this is the open beta okay mm -hmm. we had uh, uh queued a whole bunch of emails and say okay here's the link but something was wrong with the download the at t so there was some weird thing going on with something that that wasn't blizzard's fault it was some one of our partners but a day went by and the the nothing happened in the open beta. then another day went by and another and it, so it's one of those things like we're, we're, we're preparing for a test, but tech, technical problems stops us. So people stop paying attention. Okay. And it finally goes public beta. Okay. It's the word is out. I remember it was around, it was like dinner time. It was like six or seven o'clock at night. And the PA system announces attention. The wow open beta is now live. 
The first transport is away. I repeat, <laughs> the first transport is away. And, you know, the, the, the PA goes off. Our reaction was, we have a PA system? <laughs> you know, that's a, we have a PA system? And, oh, and we're, we're waiting for, oh, here, here it comes. And then nothing happens. And we're all looking at each other. And a couple people look out their door to see if anybody's gathering in the hallways. Nobody's gathering in the hallways. We're still working. It's 7 o'clock at night. They go back, and Aaron Keller and I just started laughing. <laughs> it was like, we couldn't care less. It was just like, it was just so pathetic that we just didn't care less. Yet, outside of the building, okay, outside of the Blizzard building, Battle.net melts it goes down oh, the, it, no. like the, i mean just the entire world except uh uh 133 theory was where we were at that was our location in irvine uh nobody cared like no like we talked about <laughs> it after like when dinner finally came then as we were sitting around eating our spaghetti or pizza or whatever it was uh people would talk well would you want to work on another mmo no i definitely not how many things you know how many copies was it, there would be just like this casual uh because frankly they were playing a build that was probably six months old three months old some super old build there's nothing exciting we had seen everything like if we got excited you know this is of course the tail end of the development that we'd be we'd be excited about pets you know cats house cats in the game that was the last really big thing that everybody got excited about was little, you know, uh, dogs and cats in the game. But we couldn't care less. It was just <laughs> like, eh, you know, a couple of people would go to the forums, but we had gone to the forums for the, the announcement of the game was a huge deal on the team. The t product productivity shut down for two days when we announced at the ECTS. Uh, Mark was in Europe, so that was okay. He he wasn't watching our schedule, so uh, we, Mark was away. The, the the mice were playing. I was at ECTS. Yeah. Yes, you were at ECTS. Yeah. I have your I, I have your letter, by the way. That's part of the book. That you oh. Sent us. It, there's nothing bad in shit. it. Yeah. I flipped my shit because the automated Sierra's automated. They paid a million bucks for this automated email system. And it sent out the news of the game before oh, we yeah. announced the leak. it. The leak. And I, I have a flying uh, phobia. I, I hate planes. I hate travel. And I feel like I'm risking my life every time I take a flight. Mm -hmm. So this was, I took it really personally. I was like, I did not schlep my way on a plane and, and risk my life to come out here. Because that's the way I really feel because it's such a, you know, it's such a, a, a phobia of, of flying that it was that pressing. I mean, and I was tired and, you know, and we, were, and we were getting this build ready to announce and we're prepping for this. And when I heard that Sierra's million dollar email system goofed and, you know, basically stole the thunder and jumped, jumped the clock on the announcement, I was furious. I, I wanted whoever was responsible for that email system fired. I was just livid <laughs> because it, the emotions were so high, you know, and uh, it was, it, 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 John's right. We, we we tried to shield the team from a lot of that. Um, but, but the email that I'm referring to was you after the event. No one had heard of it at the event. That uh, uh, no, it was all positive. You were describing to the devs what the ECTS was. Oh, after after we actually demoed the game. Yeah, where hoof and mouth disease was kind of like a. Uh, uh, do you remember you remember that hoof and mouth? No. Yeah. You're not well, talking about well, the SARS incident, are you? No. Yes. Well, no, no, not the SARS incident. I'm talking about hoof and mouth. They went. Okay, so ECTS European Computer Trade Show. Okay, they go to the UK, and the UK had just had uh, they had killed tons and tons, tens of thousands of cows. Uh, they had slaughtered oh, them, and right. one of your characters in the demo was called hoof and mouth. Okay, so yeah. which was uh, like the American? It, there's foot of mouth. And right, right, mouth, right. Yes, it's okay. So, so, oh, go on, John. So it was a little foible that, or not? Uh, it was like a little um, uh, misstep 
where you weren't being sensitive to this catastrophic loss of beef in the UK. And one of the characters, so you had to rename the character and uh, anyway. I don't remember that at all. You I wrote, remember, yeah, this is I your email to the team that you were out. talking about. <laughs> So is this why there's no flying mounts in Classic WoW? Is because you're afraid of flying, Mark? <laughs> <laughs> no, purely, purely. Well, there's a lot of reasons for it. We didn't want to shrink the world, and I think that no, was, that's you know, good. flying, that's flying really mounts good. was was yeah. a, ultimately yeah. one of the things that people say was one of the things they wish they could have turned back. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. We we didn't want to shrink the world. We wanted travel time to be a thing. Uh, we were fine with taxis because you could they were on fixed routes and you could right. oversee it and you can't unlock it until you get you on foot explored the other area, and uh, we wanted that sense of world. One thing that modern MMOs lack now that I really miss is the feeling that you could live in this world, that it's not just a right. game, that it is an alternate reality, and you could retire here or spend your life here, and 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 and. And it feels real. It feels like a living life experience. Mm -hmm. And you don't get that with modern MMOs. It's all about the race to the end. And you're just, you know, uh, using group finder, dungeon finder, whatever, to get through the, the next content. And you're, you're doing it mostly solo. And, yeah, you, you miss all that. But there's a trend I've noticed here, John. Plague seems to follow World of Warcraft. You've got the Corrupted Blood incident. You've got the hoof and mouth thing. <laughs> yeah. And do you remember the SARS episode? Oh, it's in the book, too. Oh, yeah, you went to... Uh... <laughs> You were talking to uh, partners uh, abroad. So, uh, we were, we were going to pick who was going to operate Asian the game partners, in China. Yes, yeah. and uh, you were. Uh, we all called them uh, Patient Zero for for a few <laughs> days because he had to be quarantined. You were quarantined for for quite a while. I think I really? had. Really. Uh, yeah. It was, yeah, it was a while. I got back from China, and days. this is when the SARS epidemic hit, and everyone thought this was the 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 this was it this was the avian flu that was going to wipe out like half the planet right and um <clears throat> and i got back and i was having cold like symptoms and at the airport they hand you a yellow card that says if you have these symptoms go see a doctor right and so because they were you know cdc uh a center for disease control was really worried about this and so i got this card and i had these symptoms and so i quarantined myself in my place and i and i told my girlfriend i need food I can't really eat because all I could eat was soup. I was like, buy me some soup. Just drop it at the door. Do not come in because I, I might have been exposed to this, this horrible, horrible disease that's killing people. And, um, and so, you know, I would get the food delivered and I wasn't getting any better. I wasn't getting any better at all. And so I decided to go to the emergency room, but I was really concerned about infecting anyone. And so I went, they have a side door. I looked all around the emergency room walk-in center and they have a side door for, um, you know, uh, uh, biological or chemical contagion, right? Mm -hmm. And it's, and and a big red button that says "Ring this doorbell if if you know if if you're in need of if you believe you've been exposed to this or if this sort of incident's happened to you." So I'm like, great, they've got a special path for this. <laughs> I don't have to go through a waiting room and sit around a bunch of people and maybe infect all of them with a deadly disease that I may or may not have. And so I I rang the uh, the buzzer. And nothing happened. Nobody answered the door. And <laughs> and uh, to be honest, if, if you worked there, would you answer the, you know, if the light came on that said <laughs> the infectious disease door, there's someone there, would you go answer it? Uh, you know, this pro the thing probably hasn't been used in years, right? So that, and so, um, so I ended up, you know, um, having to go into the main room. And I, I went right to the front desk. And I, I didn't want to sit with any of the other patients. And I'm like, and I handed them the, the yellow card that the Center of Disease Control had uh, sent me. And I said, I might have been exposed to SARS. I was in China. Um, can you can you please have someone see me? And the lady just didn't take me seriously at all. She's like, what's SARS? And it was all over the news in China when I was there, right? It's like it's like people are dying and, and everyone's freaking out in Asia. And they think that this thing is going to wipe out half the planet if it's not contained. And I'm just aghast i'm like um okay well this card explains it it's a very serious disease that's highly infectious and i i think i need to see someone because i haven't gotten better and i have all these symptoms they made me wait hours so what i did was instead of waiting with the clientele i got a blanket out and and, and a game boy and i sat uh, on the grass away from everybody as i could and and told them that i would be outside and waited 
And finally, the doctor saw me, and he's like, what makes you think you have SARS? And he didn't even have a mask on. And I just came from China trying to find a partner for World of Warcraft, and everyone's got masks on. Everyone's worried about this stuff. And the doctor's just kind of chuckling and saying, you know, what's the big deal? And um, as soon as he called the Center of Disease Control, they wouldn't let me leave. It was total <laughs> shutdown. Okay, and suddenly the mask is on, <laughs> and he yeah. comes back in. He's got a mask on. The nurse has got a mask on. You know, and they're all hovering around me and they say, "You can't leave," and you got to stay at the hospital. It's like, how much is that going to cost? It's like, well, well, your deductible's five hundred. It's like, wait, I'm being quarantined against my will, and I get to pay for it? <laughs> they're like, yes. <laughs> And so I'm telling the team this. I'm like, I can't come back to work. I'm quarantined. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the team took great pity on me. And they actually sent me a goodie bag and a giant card that they had all signed. And the goodie bag had all sorts of stuff that somebody who's quarantined for several weeks might need, including, for several some reason, weeks? a Playboy magazine. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> not good, so, not good. Um, and, yeah, so they say, we don't know how long you're going to be here. You're, you're either going to recover or you'll be dead, you know? Just <laughs> <Right>. So, and, you know, they had me in, in, in a room with double airlock doors and a, and a big machine. I remember not being able to sleep because this machine was so loud. It was like a jet engine recycling the air and purifying it or something. But I could not sleep. And then, uh, and then I was watching the news and other planes were coming in and the CDC would, would say, oh, two people came in on an aircraft from China suspected of having SARS. We're going to... We're, we're gonna, shut the plane down on the landing pad and 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 and, uh, and check it out and these guys were released these these passengers were released within two days and i was still stuck in the hospital i was so livid i was like the cdc cleared these guys Did they forget about me i'm sitting here i haven't died i'm not getting worse you know and uh, but the team was great they came and visited shane came and visited they had to put on like you know right special like gowns. Visit, right? Uh, and, yeah and uh, so and, how far along into the really development was this Oh, we we're pretty close to Yeah, the you were talking to uh So this is partners. before it's launched. So probably a year before it launched. Be before okay. it's launched, okay. and we're yeah. trying to find a partner in China, and we're freaking out over, can we launch a game in three territories at the same time, Korea, you know, the U.S., and, and, and pretty soon China. And and then, okay, John, I'll leave. I'll, you take it from here. What happened when I got back to the office finally? All right, so, wow, I just opened the book to Blizzard Looks to Asia. How is how fortuitous is that? Okay, so <laughs> page 190. Uh, you guys talk amongst yourselves. I'll find uh, uh, what uh, Mark is talking about. Yeah, we're, we're getting backed up quite a bit on a bunch of questions, so, like, we can, we can go through some of these for sure. Uh, this is a question that Firehead actually had last week. Uh, and it was about like alternate skins. Well, this really, this might lean more towards John, but, uh, I'll go ahead and say it anyway. Um, planning on like alternate skins of battlegrounds back when they were in development. I, I've, he actually sent me some screenshots cause it's something that I, I wasn't aware of, but I guess like Warsong Gulch had a, uh, basically like it was, it was textured differently. There was, there was like files or the screenshots of it being textured differently with like a, a human, uh, sort of theme to it. Like, I, I don't know anything about this actually. But uh, this uh, is not something that I knew about. Completely wrong. Um, okay. Warsong Gulch was... Now, Warsong Gulch was pretty tough because I had to have the same footprint, the exact same walls. Uh, if something was smooth or curved uh, or, or flat, uh, it was hard to do an orc building and a night elf building with the exact same footprint because they're okay. very fundamentally type of different uh, footprints. I think that they're probably looking at a human keep or, oh, I know what they're looking at. They're looking at a bunch of guild castles, which was this pitch. And I don't, Mark, you, you, you probably don't even remember. Remember I had a whole, I had a row of these little, uh, upgradable castles. Okay. The, the, they would get better and better. Uh, it kind of like you would see how a component in Farmville would slowly <laughs> improve on different like type of, right. uh, you know, uh. they, it would just be like different shutters. It would go from metal shutters to golden shutters or something like that. Uh, and that's how I showed to Alan and him. He loved the idea that it might have some implication on uh, guild housing, but some of that stuff creeped into the game. Right. And 
even though we never used them, they were super low poly. They were just like tests uh, of what we could have. Uh -huh. And uh, yeah, that's what they're probably looking at. Now, there's Orson another Ultra's area that people absolutely always uh, orc and uh, night elf. What's the other area that people always ask us about? The files they discovered, like some someone was asking if it was going to be a raid at some point. Oh, uh, Azara, Azara Basin. Right, Azar yeah. Crater, Azar Crater. Yeah, Azar Crater. I, yeah, I couldn't remember, John. So I was going to ask you. I actually, I just talked to, uh, I chatted with uh, Jim Chadwick. He's a lead level designer on uh, on WoW. Mm -hmm. So Jim is uh, one of our first. Well, we we for, hired four uh, exterior level designers at this at the same time. Jim was uh, one of them, and he's now the lead on the, the WoW team for exteriors and. Jim said that uh, with Arathi Basin playing so well that we didn't need to duplicate the uh, the battleground. It wouldn't have changed significantly. It would have been a slightly different, but it would have been roughly the same game. This is so, for Ajara Crater. Yeah, it was yeah. Ajara Crater. Right. So, so he just well it was just decided why why do the exact same thing let's do something different so it's trivial i mean he probably spent maybe like four or five days on it and he chucked it and moved on to the next thing so that's that's what happened mm. there's yeah. just a lot of stuff that people dug up and they asked me what was the plan for this and and i can't remember and you, you have to talk to the person on the team so much content was flying in so fast at the end shane and i would log into the build and suddenly there was a new area that we'd never seen before. It, w it, it got to the point where we could not keep track of what was going into the game because it was happening so fast at the end. <clears throat> and so when people ask me, uh, what was this area and what was that? I, I have a hard time recalling, and I'm glad I'm not the only one. I'm glad John had to ask <laughs> someone else, and it wasn't just me. Yeah, I know. Uh, <laughs> I'm looking in the book for your, your, your SARS instance, incident still. So I think it's the moments. We, we talked about housing a little bit. Um, you know, you know your your you know, proposal for for guild housing. Uh, you guys are familiar with Dark Age of Camelot. I thought the housing system in that game was so cool. Was there ever any thought of putting something similar to that in the game? Like I know they they eventually put in garrisons, but it's not quite the same. It's not like an open area where you can go and check out other people's houses and stuff. And I and we talk, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I don't know. We talk. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, we we talked about it, but no one could come up with a good idea to 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 to. Is that where you where you were where you where you were going? Well, basically, I uh, sorry. A, a lot of people think that the the portal there's a portal in Stormwind that's gated off, and a lot of people yeah. think that that could have been a player housing. Oh, it was okay. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. By the way, March two thousand and two was uh, yeah during the internal alpha March. That was the SARS outbreak uh, amid international tensions with North Korea and a SARS out, uh, outbreak. Mark traveled to Seoul, Taipei. China, may, uh, yeah, oh, yeah. This is the whole thing, yeah. So they they surround. It's in there. <laughs> John, hold up the book because people got to see see this thing that you wrote. You know, and it, it's just massive. Show them the spine. It, it, Show them how see, thick it, it is. It looks like it looks like a textbook. Okay, <laughs> it, it's, it's yeah. That that's the textbook. This is a cheap and dirty printout. You can. This is print on demand. Okay, mm -hmm. so it's not a. The, the final product, I've got a dummy book somewhere around here. That's the actual, the, the printer makes a dummy book with the actual print, the, the paper and the weight, and you can feel the, the hard binding. But mm -hmm. yeah, this is the uh, the chimp, uh, cheap printout. It's, I it's wanted massive, it to, though. It, it, it's oh, huge. Yeah, yeah it's uh, yeah. costly, like $36 to mail this to Australia. That's so far the most expensive um thing and everyone's complaining about the, the shipping but that's what it takes i mean you know international shipping is brutal oh it's but, unbelievable uh, yeah they're killing me on uh but player housing was going to be a, a big thing i mean i'm remembering now alan had huge plans for player mm -hmm. housing yeah you with, were supposed to to instance into a neighborhood where everyone would have neighborhoods own house. that's what we call it we called it neighborhoods yeah, yeah. because you and, wanted to peacock and show your own house to uh, your neighbors but, and uh, housing had to have a good reason for you to be there, or housing never gets used. So, so yeah. Alan didn't want it just to be vanity-based. 
um, he wanted actual uh, trading, player to player trading, I think was going to go on there and things like vendors, like you could have, I forget how it was going to work, but he had some plan where um, players could, you know, set up shop and, and sell stuff to other players in there. This would be prior wow. to auction house. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Because we would talk about the problem with auction houses is that there is no social component to it. It's all yeah. just emailed to you and everything else. And Alan was huge on the social aspects of the game mm -hmm. and everything that he designed for it. And, and it was really a lot of his vision that, uh, that drove wow. And he, so what he wanted was, okay, maybe there's an auction house, but you still have to go see the guy to get your item, you know, and, um, or go to the, their house at least and, and their vendor or something, something to establish that sort of personal relationship. And, um, and I think, housing was supposed to dovetail into that but i do remember distinctly the portal and stormwind and the neighborhoods that were supposed to be instant stacked uh of these different player houses we didn't want houses we, we loved ultima online so much so many of us played it but we didn't want houses like just carpeted over the land like it was in that game and getting in the way of the content and everything yeah. else and so <laughs> the idea was to portal this stuff off into instance neighborhoods where, where every every player would get their own house you guys speak very highly of Alan, both John and Mark. Uh, John, I think you mentioned him a bunch of times in your book. Mm -hmm. um, out of curiosity, you know, it seems like Alan had a huge role to play in the game. Could you kind of give us, kind of give us a little background on Alan? And okay, his role? so I, 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 you know, during these AMAs, lots of questions. Sometimes thoughts kind of congeal into a perfect nugget. Okay, Alan Adham is the Steve Jobs of Blizzard that hates publicity mm. right that's how and i that's understandable like you, you, yeah you don't like some people just don't want a lot of attention yeah he's uh, very absolutely brilliant he's he's probably one of uh, one of the the best designers of all time and people haven't heard of him yeah because he the most patient person in the world just <laughs> yeah <laughs> well, okay, I'm sorry. Patient when he's watching somebody play the game. Like, he's a slave driver like Alan Jobs, or, or Steve Jobs. Uh, but, uh, yeah, he's... Alan was like a father figure. You always wanted to please him. You always wanted to go the extra yeah. mile for him. Oh, yeah. Uh, and, and it's really his philosophy guided all of Blizzard's early development along with, you know, um, other key members that, you know, like... Uh, but but I, I got to give it to Alan. I mean, Alan was the one we looked up to. And when Alan, you know, stepped away from the company for a while before coming back on WoW, um, that was, you know, uh, he was sorely missed. And when he came back on WoW, it was awesome. And <clears throat> but he was also very much like Jobs, very, much, very driven and, and very passionate and sometimes fiery. And he would, you know, if you were at the the the, the layer of management that's you know, that's directly working with him, he, he would let you have it with both barrels unhesitatingly and in, in private, you know, and, um, and it was really hard to work for the guy, but amazing, but you wanted to because he was so amazing, you know, and um, it's kind of like a football coach. And, yeah. And when, and when he decided to step away towards the end of wow development, I remember, you know, I, I was at a point where I was having an argument with the guy, but I recognized how important he was and i wrote this long email and and went to talk to alan to try to convince him to stay um because i thought he, it was that important to the project whatever personal issue we had at the time and we got together years later and, you know, over lunch and dinner and everything else but <clears throat> at that time you know whatever personal issue, i said none of that's important none of that's important what's important is that this game you know has your vision in it and and we need that vision um on the title so but you know he was um he was pretty adamant about uh stepping away and he did that time but luckily recently came back he, didn't he yes yeah. he did yeah. and that bodes well for blizzard mm -hmm. that bodes very well for future blizzard titles i mean y you never hear about him but he is really the the uh, a huge component of the soul of blizzard yeah every, all all the think about all the slideshows all the all the public uh BlizzCon talks, all the GDC um, panels that you hear a Blizzard star, you know, one of the designers talk about intelligently just how the, 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 the method of making a game, they're parroting Alan. 
I mean, the, the, the longer you work with Alan, the more you just say, screw it. I'm just going to parrot what this guy <laughs> says because <laughs> there is just no arguing with the logic that is just so – it's just, just, just he's really sound everything he's yeah. just a great guy yeah so um yeah I, go ahead sorry i don't know we could talk about alan all day and you know he he doesn't need the credit you know he doesn't he count it doesn't yeah, he, care he, at all about the credit it's awesome and uh but uh but yeah I, I when i whenever i'm designing or whenever i'm making a game i'm thinking of alan you know i'm thinking what mm -hmm. would alan do yeah yeah absolutely that's awesome yeah, that's so cool. um i i have a question actually that uh, i was going to ask this earlier and I, and I just remembered um kind of going back you know focusing more on the game again we um last week john you talked about how aq was actually the first raid that you built not it wasn't molten core but but it was aq right. which is actually right. the third raid the third big 40 man raid uh, right. was there did, did the final um uh, I, I, I guess the final uh, order of raid tiers, did that match the original vision for what you guys saw? Uh, somebody asked this question during the AMA, and this is a great question. This is, there was no order. There was a list of places where we thought could be raids, and I would build a place. Karazhan wasn't supposed to be a raid. It was supposed to be a dungeon. Uh -huh. Okay. Wow. But it was big enough to actually put more people. Uh, Upper Black Rock Spire. They said a little, you know more people. Uh, they eventually set it at fifteen. Um, yeah, there was no order whatsoever. You, you were talking. I started. I had this. I have this. This funny. Uh, gra it was a graph paper with the Eastern Kingdoms and Kalimdor, and I had all our raids where. The newbie, like there was a Torin newbie dungeon. Okay. I think I think I saw this in the in the sample you showed us. Yeah, this was yeah, yeah this was in this shit sample. I think I have that paper still lying around here. That's somewhere. awesome. And uh, it was just my own perfect. I someone had written it on the board, and I thought it was it'd be important enough to actually just to re refer to. And it was just kind of neat to see. And uh, yeah, the plans changed uh, so many times. I used the example Derek Simmons built built an intra uh, web uh, intranet page where the developers could look at this map and have something that was relatively up to date and keep everybody on the same page with what the shape was where the where the cities were where where everything was in the world of Warcraft it was like the big map with all the little uh, locations of a dungeon or, or a hub or a city and it was outdated by the time he put it up. And <laughs> if, if he revised it, it would have been outdated by the time he sent that email to the to. And that's just things are constantly, constantly changing that after a couple of years, after you've shipped a game, you realize uh, at least this is the blizzard. Now, there are some companies who are very heavy handed with their plans they write a blueprint okay and to the detriment of their product the team sticks to that blueprint blizzard is a lot more agile they self-publish their own games they can delay things they can speed things up things never get sped up but they can delay things <laughs> when they when when they discover something's cool or cancel something that's really not cool they can do all this internally so your the plans are work you know yeah, man makes plans, God laughs. Okay, that's that's <laughs> quote. Yeah. So it's very so, organic. Yeah. I was gonna ask as as far as the lore goes, who was the one that was making sure that the lore was being respected or sort of maneuvered around? Was it Chris Metzen as far as your design decisions? I'm interested in in, in this, John. But yeah, well, what I remember is, is maybe a little different. Like Metzen would come in and talk about the lore and, and Okay, early on, I remember the whiteboards and the maps, and he had yeah. plans for all this stuff. Yeah. But it's, it seemed like whenever he met with, with you guys, that things would change, that ideas would get tossed around, or, uh, you know, I, I don't think it was unidirectional. I think people have an impression that Metzen would say, this is the way it is, and we'd all go do it. But you're right, there yeah. sometimes would be, you know, technological issues or level design issues, and there was back and forth, right? 
Oh, absolutely. I mean, there's cons like when when Metzen. OK, so Metzen's a game developer. He knows animation. That's where he does concept art. He did games before he actually became a lore person. Uh, he, he used to write stories about the Warcraft uh, one units and he'd kind of like get almost like do it on the side so he doesn't get in trouble for wasting time writing stories about <laughs> the characters. Like that's really how it was. And he wouldn't stop doing it. So they said, okay, we'll ship one of these stories with the Warcraft, you know, one game. Then got a little bit more serious with Warcraft too. Okay, we'll actually tell a story. We'll actually name some of these units that you're coming up with. Fine, you know, we'll do that. And that so he knows development. And when he comes to us, and this is what makes him such a great creative director, he pitches an idea to the guys who have to execute it. Yeah. Okay. So he pitches something and if they're not jiving with it or they may say, well, we kind of did that already in the Eastern Play Clans, and this is kind of right next to that. Then he'd go, oh, okay, well, what do you think would work there? You know, and only stuff, that he would only like dig in his heels if it's canon that's been shipped before in Warcraft 2 or, right. or maybe even Warcraft 3. Then he'd have to say, well, we can't introduce a, a, an inconsistency that because that's right. That, is the brand so he was super flexible and super open to cool ideas um you know like on karash would describe it as not full-on egyptian okay so but it's it's a desert temple uh he doesn't want to go crazy with doesn't want the hieroglyphs like up the yin yang and and, and super right. like looking like egypt so that's why i had this weird uh, the, the building was like a scarab beetle type kind of like on the right. ground. So it was like a roundish building. So it didn't look like Egyptian and it just found its way. At least the exterior had a little bit of its own character that way. It didn't look Greek. It didn't look Roman. It didn't look Egyptian, but it was its own thing. So that's kind of how things went. And it sometimes technology would go, Oh no! Yeah, we can't do that. Yeah, right. we'd have to scale that back. And you know, he'd say, "Well, can you do it this way?" And sometimes technology said, "Well, we can do it." Or sometimes, "No, we can't do it that way either." And sometimes design would say, "We've got so much content in the Barrens, we don't need a Wild West right. like a <laughs> mini dungeon or newbie dungeon for the Torrent." Okay, right. Torrent didn't have their own uh, uh, dungeons, so they they cancel that and because the barons had so much content and that was one of his like little things and sometimes you know it's a half hour of just musing you know he this is the easiest thing in the world to throw out he's not gonna uh versus if you got a programmer working on code for two and a half weeks if you know half hour or two and a half weeks right. you definitely go with you know check out the half hour so metzen was super flexible i found him to be very inspiring uh to work because you could inject your own things and he wasn't a micromanager as long as you were in the flavor that he was going for um yeah go ahead go nuts that's that's what he was and, and it's not like chris reviewed every single quest text that came through too i mean there was so much stuff that had to go into the game so fast no um, he, he did review names though Names, names were absolutely yeah. something because he had a great naming scheme. I I have a whole chapter devoted to lore. I mean, yeah. So kind of going back to you know you're talking about the design of and the style of like AQ, uh, AQ20 and AQ40 have have two very like distinct designs. Like AQ20 is a surface level raid, and then AQ40 you go underground. It's more cavernous. Um, were there because you made AQ first? Was it originally in the plans to eventually introduce 20 man raids as a kind of catch up mechanic or no? Nope. Okay. No, nope. we had some pieces. Uh, we pulled out some pieces from the temple and we were going to just, that was, I think some of the flavor. Uh, Alan was really into the idea of this is not all of his ideas are great. The, uh, the common areas. Okay. The common areas are where all the elite mobs are. 
where people are supposedly going to group up to take out elite mobs until enough people show up that you have a a, a dungeon crew. And then you'll just like, without a care in the world, you'll roll into that dungeon and have a grand time. Okay, that was his vision. <laughs> but uh, I think we just made a bunch of pieces because it was easy. We had textures for it. We had geometry. We had, it had its own like visual language of what the uh, temple was going to look like. I had enough pieces that Matt Sanders, who was the exterior level designer at the time, could just arrange stuff around. And I'm sure one of the, probably Jeff Kaplan uh, or uh, Alex Afrasabi, he was the guy behind the uh, AQ event big time. He, uh, they probably had the idea, you know what? I'm feeling enough that we could make cool content for two raids here. And that's probably where it happened. They saw really? uh, Matt Sanders uh, putting all this flavor stuff around the temple before you go into the AQ40 area. I think they saw all that and said, you know, we could get ourselves this. Just make why not do a raid on the on the surface, on the exterior, like right. uh, uh, Zolgarub. So um, that's unless Zolgarub came afterwards. I think Zolgarub was, was 1.7. Yeah. yeah, yeah. ZG was first. Yeah. Okay. So. Right. Love Zul Zulgarub. Um, yeah, so that and that's pretty much it. And I remember like them trying, them pulling Metzen into the conversation, saying, "Okay, what are some of what 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 could be some of the boss monsters?" And this is my, <laughs> I don't know why it's funny. Okay, <laughs> where Metzen? Okay, he 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 did his homework and he came up with a bunch of bosses. He came up with like I don't know six or nine bosses or something ridiculous. He was always a little bit testy when you tried to nail him down on a boss, because it was just something that I don't know he didn't think he needed to do right now. And somebody asked him the first boss was this beast, like a like a insect kind of beast mm -hmm. coming out of the ground, and he just wanted it to be bestial. He didn't want to get too buggy or too hive-ish okay and this is just during the and jeff kaplan so what, what's the name of that monster and that's just like i don't know fucking mongo you know that just <laughs> just makes up the, it's just the funniest freaking name in the uh... world i would love to be killing a boss <laughs> named mongo okay and I don't know why that's funny but uh i just that's yeah. just classic. just throw something that's out it. there for now yeah well just Put a placeholder for crying out loud. We'll get to it when we get to it, you know. <laughs> yeah. His That's language weird. was so colorful, too. I I <laughs> yeah. Like, he's more pepper. We got to wear more pepper to this. Or, uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. You, you guys used pepper. to joke about, you know, he also said, it needs to be epic. It needs to be mighty. And so we had the <laughs> epicity. We called it the epicity scale and the yeah, mitosity scale. Yeah, epicity. Yes, mitosity. <laughs> and so when we reviewed dungeons and stuff, it was like, well, I could use another point or two on the epicity scale and maybe tone down the mitosity half a degree. Yeah. <laughs> That's had great. To be, whatever we made had to have pepper, be epic, and mighty. And those were the guiding <laughs> principles. Yeah, yeah. yeah. My toss it. Quantitative yeah. values for sure, yeah. And you know what? It, it's funny. It, when Aaron was working on the – remember when Aaron was working on the login screen and everybody oh. was – Okay, so you were probably busy on uh, business stuff at this point. This is kind of at the tail end right before the uh, – the probably the the alpha probably the uh not alpha um public uh, uh open beta uh the, the the login screen uh could be anything so everybody was bothering aaron about the the, the login screen they all wanted to pitch the ideas and this is you know Met, metzen's a dork too don't don't let him fool you he's a nerd just like anybody else he comes in and he i remember it was friday night okay Aaron and I were, Aaron was ready to go home to his wife at seven o'clock in rolls Mets in. He's like, okay, I want to give you my, my take on what could be a real cool login. Okay. So this is pitch number 47 for Aaron <laughs> hearing about what a cool login screen could be. Okay. And Metzen starts talking about the Titans. Okay. And Metzen likes the Titans like no one else likes the Titans because no one else liked the Titans. They were a pain in the ass to work with. They were all way too hard to scale in the game. When you're a little player, you know, 
super, you know, Galactus, Galacticus type of Titan type of uh, uh, characters and, and, and creatures that he wanted. He starts talking about how they made the world of Warcraft. Like he gets into the cosmogony of how the world was created and and Aaron, I know, like, I'm digging this, okay? Because I'm a nerd. I don't have a wife to go home to on Friday night, okay? So I'm digging it, okay? So I'm list- I'm hearing from the source the you know what he wanted to, and I can just see Aaron just trying not to, oh, oh she's waiting for me right now, and I'm hearing <laughs> this long-winded piece. And he, we, we started talking about the, the Warcraft movie. That's the first time I, I heard about the Warcraft really? movie. He started pitching, and that's that's the first time, of course, I have an opinion already on the Warcraft movie. I'm saying don't make it too complicated. Just do one little story. Just do one little story. And I remember telling him that. But anyway, he starts talking and talking and talking. He goes through the whole lore of Warcraft 1, Warcraft 2. Aaron's just like, oh, don't care, don't care, don't care. I, but, yeah. <laughs> but just the creative director. So, you know, he's kind of like trying to prop up a smile. That was, uh, anyway, that's, uh, that's medicine sometimes. That, that's crazy, like how, how like just, just mentally invested, like mentally and emotionally invested he is into totally. it. Totally. Just, that's totally. so cool to me. Sometimes he comes off very cool, don't be fooled, he's a dork. Okay, <laughs> he's a dork like every. Uh, just can, like he's us. got the right, just like he's got the right heavy metal yep. shirts, the right posters. But you know what? He's a nerd like anybody else. That's great. This is this is a little different between Blizzard as it was and Blizzard as it is now. I mean, you're you're hearing stories about how casual it was between Metzen and the team, and how it was back and forth and everything. It was really kind of flat, and you had these names in Blizzard. And what happened later on is there was the company got really big. And so some people were basically elevated and enshrined in these positions and access. It becomes, I think that's something natural, right? That's something natural. So we worked at, we were there at Blizzard at a time where anybody could say anything to each other. And, you know, Metzen's the creative director, but you still have people sitting there, you know, jiving with him and pushing it pushing back and forth ideas and things like this and what happens when you get to a certain size is i think people um don't have access to that anymore not as many people do and yeah things get i think stratified a little more and it all, yeah. seems like also, something natural that happens over time board, people who new people who come on board are afraid to push back or afraid to to to, to challenge an idea and that you know you lose something when that happens it, but 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 also Chris was, Chris wasn't like the person elevating himself to. Yeah, I don't want to. Yeah, it, it, that's right. Not, it, it, it's yeah. when 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 there's now instead of a team of uh, forty people, you've got, you know, a hundred something people. Uh, you you have kind of jealousy of some people have access to nets and they, you, he only has so much time, and you kind of like can't say everybody can have access to him. Yeah, um, you can understand. Made... You can understand how, as a new hire, someone new to the company, how it can be hard to sort of like get into the click or or you feel feel sort of at home like the other people that have that have been there for a very long time. You know. Yeah. Well, yeah. the company it, it's not even that where you feel like it's a click or anything. It's just that the company's so large, it's not physically possible to yeah, have it's these not possible interactions yeah. anymore. It, John's right. Chris never elevated himself. Never. I mean, that, no. 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 That, no that just happened as a function of scale you know when the company gets to be a certain size and um and you know and 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 that's why i think people really like smaller teams that's why you know in pardo's new company he's all about 10 15 person teams and you know uh and that's why i i don't like teams above 30 because the drama index goes up Uh you know um and um you know it's just it's just something that you lose and i think that you know, you get the best ideas when you can when you can pitch stuff back and forth like this, and everyone is 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 playing hardball to try to get their idea out there and try to get the best idea. But at the end of the day, everyone just wants the right thing for the game, you know, and they're very no passionate doubt. about that. So we're, here, here's a question here: Did you yeah, guys ever think of of guild banks going into vanilla WoW because they were added at the tail end of TBC? Not in vanilla, no. Okay, no, no, we. Pretty and, sure we talked guild about banks? them. Guild banks? Guild banks? Yeah. I mean, storage, guild storage. Had, 
Well, I I guess. Yeah, maybe so. Okay. Well, there's a there was a laundry list of things we needed to get oh, to. Oh yeah, I'm yeah. Pretty sure like... Guild Banks. I'm pretty okay. sure talk. I remember right, talking. So. Even back when we were talking about trading, when we we're doing uh, the anti cheat trade interface because in diablo 2 you could like yank the item back at the last minute and the trade would go through and the guy would be ripped <laughs> off Yoink. and so we would engineer all these safety mechanisms into the trade ui and also uh, you know we we talked i think anytime we talked about guilds or housing or anything else i'm pretty sure storage came up sure. uh but there's so much i mean so it was originally it, linked it, to housing basically no I, I don't want to say that i'm saying that it was on the same sort oh, of list okay, that okay. housing was. It was on a wish that, list. Right. The list. Right. Well, we didn't we call it the list of love? Was, is that what we call oh. it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This was this was so that ideas didn't get forgotten. This is coming oh, back yeah. to me now. They had a whole long list. Yeah. There's there's a couple and, pictures of. And I think it was called the list of love because it's like, hey, these are great ideas, but we can't get to them, so we're going to keep them in this file. And it was just in and so that people's. People felt that their idea was listened to and heard, and you know, and 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 it's just it wasn't a priority night right now, and so it would go into this giant list, which you know half lived in hard copy and half lived in people's minds, you know, as as memory, collective memory, as oh yeah, we want to get to that someday. That's awesome. Uh, yeah, we um, we are running kind of short on time, so I I want to get to just like a couple more questions. Oh, there it is. What is it's that? Right there. Oh, is there. That the list? Oh, there you go. There that is, is the is. Uh, that's the whiteboard, with uh, with uh, this is the designer's whiteboard. Um, I don't think the list is quite there. I think I uh, there's there's another whiteboard in here that does have that long list, a whole bunch of ideas. They put the things that they didn't like, um, frown faces by them. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So let's let's uh, let's wrap it up here with a couple more questions. Uh, one is what was there anything for you guys that got cut from the final game that you guys were you know you really wanted to see in the game before it shipped well nothing well let me quote mark kern okay we're not cutting anything we're just putting it to the back burner okay <laughs> right. so that and that that is mark talking to just a burnt out dev team you know low morale Wondering why, oh, this is such a cool idea. Why can't we do it? You know, we're not cutting it. We're just pushing it off. It's a living game. You know, we're going to have updates. We're going to have more features. We're going to, uh, so, yeah, that. Mm -hmm. I, I, right? Oh, I've got one. I, I know instantly. Sure. Um, every time I, I play The Witcher and I get sucked into Gwent, I remember how I really wanted a couple things I pitched. I really wanted, and a couple people really wanted, a trading card game um, oh, in yeah. World of Warcraft. Oh. And I wanted it to be organic so that you could play it anywhere, but when you went into an inn, because we were always looking for a way to make inns more relevant, mm -hmm. when you played it at an inn at a city or in Goldshire or anything, you would automatically be ranked competitively. So, you know, if you go to an inn, that's where you yeah. play competitive, or you could play anywhere else. And I really wanted to see this. And I wanted to be able to be redeemed for physical cards, too. So you could actually play. Because we, we used to play so many uh, collectible Magic. card games at, at yeah. Blizzard. And um, I really, really wanted to see that. It was, um, But the other thing that went in, I, I, I got fishing. I, I, I loved that. So um, that was something that Eric uh, you know, worked on. Yeah. And it was uh, actually because my wife loved fishing in Japanese RPGs. Um, oh, so, really? Yeah. <laughs> and so it was a wow. gift to her. I, I went to Eric and I said, um, you know, uh, can you can you make a fishing game that that would be cool? And and he did. And he went off with with someone else. Sam, and they, they, Sam Watinga. He coded. Yeah. It. yeah. And they, they put, put together, together a fishing prototype and we got into the game. Yeah. And so I was really happy. But the card game didn't make it. I really wanted to see that in there, especially since we play, uh, especially since I, I you know, I, I enjoyed Gwent in Witcher and um you know, it, it seems like a no-brainer now with Hearthstone, right? <laughs> oh yeah. yeah, well, I mean, that was I I, I even mentioned this that the the my first time I've heard about that someone from Blizzard North had made a a, a physical card game that the designers Eric, uh, Frank Gilson, uh, Bo, they were playing this. We were, you know we were all the card you know Magic the Gathering uh, you know champions, and we were like playing this and 
going, wow, this is better than 80% of the uh, uh, CCGs out there. And we wanted to have rares appear on mobs, you know, as a drop. And, oh, boy, I can put that into my deck, you know, that kind of thing. But holy moly, that would have been, that is such a pie in the sky type. I mean, everybody loved it, but it's kind of funny that we're talking 2002, then Blizzard made their card game, okay, uh, and then Hearthstone came how many years later? I mean, it was a few generations of uh, of that type of... What was that, 2013 or 2014 was Hearthstone? I think 2014 was the... Or 2014 was the beta, I think. Yeah, I don't remember. Okay, everyone yeah. calls it Hearthstone, but I'm pretty sure that on the team, I was pronouncing it Hearthstone for the longest time. And I think yeah. most it people were, no, not, not not when we were talking about the game didn't exist. The, the rock. We were yeah. talking about we were talking about the rock. Yeah, the, the, the actual stone. Yeah. And and every time I hear Hearthstone, I don't Hearth, know, it feels Hearth, like the it feels of weird them. to me. Yeah. Oh yeah, because <laughs> I always I, called it Hearthstone. Oh, I, I I thought it was like the hearth of of the fire. Like you know, that's 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 by the inn. Mm -hmm. You've yeah. got a nice big hearth by the fire. Well, yeah, that's the correct pronunciation. I just oh. been mispronouncing it. Oh, okay. All right. All right. Strangely so, enough, there's a, there's a street in Irvine called Hearthstone. Hearthstone. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Um. Right. So so one last question. Uh, I mean, clearly this you know obviously people are going to be asking this question a lot. Um. We've all said before, tips, stay safe. Myself, we all kind of expect to. Um. We're all you know we're we're being a little bit optimistic, but we're we're all hoping to see some sort of testing period this year when we're we think that the game could come out as early as next year. Uh, John John talked about it again on the last podcast, and uh, for you, Mark, like, how do you feel like given the kind of the update that they've given with the water cooler update? They said they're on the third prototype. They have a plan listed out. They've been pretty transparent about. Um, how do you feel? It's ready when it's ready. Uh, that's the blizzard ma um, uh, mantra and it's really uh, it all depends on what great ideas drop out of that process you know as they're as they're playing that prototype what 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 sparks the imagination about what would be cool to do and i think blizzard's going to do something really i think they're looking for something special something cool uh whether it's um you know um well you know i i think you're going to see something that hasn't been talked about that not game changing or anything like that but there's going to be some clever little thing in there that links the the current game to the, to the classic game or something that that we haven't heard of that's what i'm hoping for because that's i've seen that happen so many times at blizzard where great ideas just percolate to the top and that's what i'm hoping for here that they've got something something special planned and if so take as long as they need you know make sure that it's it's quality yeah, I'm hoping uh, I'm hoping this BlizzCon's a pretty special one. That's for sure. <laughs> so, um, yeah, uh, we can all hope. We can hope. Yeah, we can hope. Please. Yeah, Please. but guys, uh, you know, we we are uh, we are out of time here. We've gone uh, a little bit over time, actually. Uh, thank you guys for joining us. Uh, if you guys haven't already, please. Uh, you guys can follow tips, stay safe, John and Mark. I mean, all, all the links are down there uh, below the uh, below below everybody's uh, camera pictures, and. Uh, if you if you guys missed the earlier part of Classicast, I will be posting this on YouTube, uh, on my YouTube channel, youtubecom TV. Again, if you haven't subbed to Tips and stay safe, you guys should do that as well. And uh, Tips is actually gonna go ahead and stream afterwards if you guys want to check out Tips Stream. And uh, we will see you guys next time. Thank you so much for joining us, John. Yeah, thank you, thank you Mark. Watching. Thanks for having. Me. Really thank appreciate that. On again, thank you very much. Yeah. Bye bye.